morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Paweł Chmielinski, and we are uh, hosted by the Institute of, of uh, Rural and Agricultural Development of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, the seminar entitled Quality of Governance at the Regional Level, uh, Comparative Analysis. Uh, the sem seminar is one of the 10 events marking the 50th anniversary of the Institute of Rural Agricultural Development of the Polish Academy of Sciences and one of two devoted to the quality of governance. I'll be speaking about it later, probably at the beginning, at, at the end of today's meeting. Um, but, but we are honored to, to co-organize this seminar together with, uh, with our colleagues from uh, from the uh, University of Gothenburg and the uh, Universidad Carlos de Madrid. So um, it, is, it is difficult to lead, uh, to lead in normal life when there is a war going uh, just uh, across the border. Uh, but today we are going to speak about the administration, the quality of governance, about institutions, and institutions are relations between people and governance is the quality of those relations. Uh, without trust and cooperation, institutions do, do not work. So uh, all actions towards society will be chaotic. And, and today we'll see how, uh, how, we, how much we need the strong institutions. So that's why today we should debate on the quality of public institutions even more. Um, about the level of trust in them, the media freedom and the social trust, which are all components of the quality of governance. Uh, today we'll have a nice uh, seminar starting with the several uh, presentations and inviting us to the debate on the quality of the governance at the regional level. Uh, I would like first to introduce the speakers and then speak a bit about the agenda and then we'll start. So among our speakers, we have uh, uh, honorable guests from the University of Gothenburg and the authors of, uh, of uh, one of the uh, greatest uh, uh, service and the uh, research uh, event in the, in the in Europe, uh, measuring quality of the governance. And uh, this, this team is composed by uh, Monika Baul, uh, who is a professor at the Department of the Political Science at the University of Gothenburg, and a research fellow at the Quality of Governance Institute. Uh, she has previously been a visiting scholar uh, at the Harvard University, Stanford University, and the University of Florida in the US but also University of Des as Salam in Tanzania. Uh, Monika investigates the causes and consequences of the corruption and the quality of government and public support for international distribution, EU integration and foreign aid. Our next uh, colleague, uh, Nicholas Sharon, is a senior lecturer and associate professor at the Department of Political Sciences and a research fellow at the Quality of Governance Institute of the University of Gothenburg. Nicolas' research is concerned with comparative politics on the political institutions, studies on corruption and quality of government, and how these factors impact economic development with the focus on Europe and the U US. Uh, he has also published one book on the quality of government within the European uh, Union that focuses on both national and regional level. Our next speaker is uh, Victor Lapuente, who is a senior lecturer and associate professor at the Department of the Political Science uh, and Research Fellow at the Quality of Government uh, Institute. He received his PhD in political sciences from the University of Oxford and then the Juan Mart Institute Madrid and joined the Quality of Governance Institute in 2007. Victor Research deals with the comparative public administration and corruption. And our uh, colleague from, uh, from Spain, Pablo Fernandez Vasquez, is a talent attraction associate professor at Carlos III University in Madrid. He received his PhD in political sciences from the New York University. He studied he studies political uh, representation, 
with the focus on the party competition, technocracy and populism and political corruption. And our uh, next speaker is Barbara Wiliczko. She is associate professor at the Department of European Integration, Institute of Rural and Agricultural Development at the Polish Academy of Sciences. Barbara is dealing with public policy in regional and rural uh, in pol policies. And our commentary, our discussant is uh, Professor Jerzy Wilkin, excellent specialist in political economy, institutions, and the rural development, uh, member of the Polish Academy of Sciences, uh, very honored in, uh, by the uh, many is public institutions and the universities in Poland. Uh, also, uh, he is a member of the uh, European Association of Agricultural Economics and also a fellow of this organization. And I'm Paweł Kraliński. I'm also from the uh, Department of the European Integration of the Institute of uh, Rural and Agricultural Development. And basic reading for this uh, meeting is a report, uh, Subnational Quality of Government EU Member States. Uh, this is the working paper that is available or was available and is available on our uh, website. And this is supplemented with two case studies, like more regional oriented studies, uh, Spain and Poland. Uh, and our, uh, our uh, studies are covering two different regions in each of the country. And so we will start with a general description of a, of a study and like a presentation by Nicolas Sharon and Monica Bauer about the European Quality Government Index methodology and the survey results. And then we'll have a round of a short question and answer. Uh, and this will be followed by the presentation by the Victor La Puente about the introduction to the subnational quality of government in Spain and Poland. So this will be introductory for the uh, next two presentations, one by Pablo Fernandez uh, about the subnational quality of governments in the two regions in Spain, Catalonia and Basque country. And uh, Barbara Wiliczko, together with me, will present the, the, uh, the same, like the, 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 the comparative study of the two Polish regions, Lubelskie and Opolskie. After the short question and answers round, we'll have a uh, uh, really nice introduction to the uh, general uh, debate and the discussion by the Professor Wilkin. Uh, and and will close at around two o'clock. So um, so this is uh, this is about it from the introduction. Small uh, note for the uh, for the all the uh, audience. Let's be all active in chat. Uh, you can put the the questions. We'll be look for them and and, and ask them also. Uh, but uh, and the. Uh, Last thing is that uh, seminar will be recorded. So uh, by your kind participation, uh, we, we know that you agree for the recording. Uh, of course, this is worth mentioning because this is recorded uh, because the, the, the whole seminar will be published at the, at the YouTube channel and the link will be available. And uh, Vitrina Vieska, who is uh, our, uh, our media partner, but also available in the, our institute and the seminar webpage. So thank you very much. This is uh, everything from, the, from me for the beginning. And I would like to kindly ask Nicolas Sharon and Monica Bau to present the introduction to the study and the results of the 2021 uh, survey results. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pavel. Uh, we are pulling up our slides. Thanks again uh, for inviting us uh, to speak here about the European Quality of Government Index. Uh, I agree that it's a weird time to do this, uh, but, but I, I just think that uh, the current event shows that uh, the quality of government is more relevant uh, than ever um, to study. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion and to the questions and comments. Uh, we're going to start the seminar uh, by doing a brief introduction to the European Quality of Government Index. Uh, the first, uh, the results from the 2021 round, but also comparing the results 
two previous rounds uh, of, of, of the survey. Um, first, uh, a brief background to the environment uh, where we work, Nicholas, Victor and I. Uh, we work uh, at an institute, a research institute called the Quality of Government Institute. And this is an independent uh, academic research institute within the Department of Political Science at the University of Gothenburg. So the focus of these, this research institute is mainly to do, conduct research on quality of government. Um, we were um, um, around seven people from the beginning. It was founded by Bo Rothstein and Søren Holmberg, two professors at the, our department. Uh, but since then, we have attracted uh, funding, funding and been able to grow uh, to around roughly 25 researchers, um, a couple of research assistants, database managers. Um, and by now, we have published around um, uh, 200 uh, academic research articles on the quality of government. Um, a number of books, working papers, etc. So visiting our webpage can be a good source for academic research on the quality of government. We have a lot of freely downloadable uh, material. So although our main focus is to do studies on this, we also have a, a focus on um, collecting data and, and making data freely available and also usable uh, to people. So we would have uh, data visualization tools, which allows you to go to our web page and easily click on things to, 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 to uh, show, uh, do graphs that could be available for presentations and also to conduct research uh, on data on the quality of government. So um, our motivation uh, originally for uh, creating uh, this institute was the very deep connection between the quality of government um, and human well-being uh, broadly conceived. Um, this graph that, that here shows uh, the control of corruption measure, measure as measured by the World Bank uh, on the horizontal axis and human development index from the UNDP uh, at the vertical axis. Um, and, and, and you can see this surprisingly strong connection and link uh, between the control of corruption, which could be a measure of quality of government, uh, and human development. Here, uh, measured as uh, life expectancy as birth, uh, education, and GDP per capita. And what's intriguing about this is that you can find similar graphs uh, on almost uh, all aspects of human development that we care about. This, this graph is uh, on poverty. Uh, you can see that control of corruption uh, is closely related uh, to reduced poverty uh, and also similar on environmental indicators. This is an indicator of environmental health and, and ecosystem uh, vitality. Uh, uh, and we see that countries that manages to control their level of corruption uh, are also the ones uh, that manage to implement environmental regulation and, and to provide a cleaner environment for its citizens. We recently um, published, oh, as you say also first, that uh, the, the aim of, of, of our institute, the overall aim is to carry out and promote um, research uh, about the importance uh, of trustworthy, reliable, competent, non-corrupt, non-discriminatory and impartial government institution. And this is what we call uh, quality of government. Uh, so quality of government is much broader than corruption, um, although it's difficult to imagine public institutions that are both impartial and corrupt. I think it's impossible. It's clearly possible to be partial without being corrupt. So it's important to bear in mind that our notion of the quality of government uh, is broader uh, than, than just the opposite uh, of corruption. Um, and our research uh, addresses in particular three questions. First of all, what is quality of government? Uh, we have a number of uh, articles uh, on that, that seek to conceptually develop uh, the concept of corruption and the concept of quality of government. We have work on different forms of corruption, on impartiality. And this is, of course, very important because if we don't have um, uh, um, 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 coherent definition of the concept of corruption, it's very difficult to conduct any form uh, of empirical research or measurement uh, of this topic. We also have a number of studies on the effect of quality of government. And of course, uh, the most difficult question of all, uh, what do you do if you live in a country with deeply dysfunctional government institutions? How can you move from a state of low quality of government 
uh, to a state of high quality of government. So for those of you who are interested in this broader field of research, uh, we recently published an Oxford handbook uh, on the quality of government. Um, this is a very accessible uh, kind of publication that summarizes this field of research, also points out um, uh, directions for further, for future research in, in, in this field. Um, so we, the chapters would then be on the causes and consequences and nature of quality of government, um, and of course how it can be measured. But we have other chapters as well on democracy, foreign aid, organized crime, gender taxation, inequality, sustainable development, growth, happiness, ethnic diversity, civic conflicts, et cetera, et cetera. So by clicking on this link, you will be able to access uh, these chapters by us, but also by the wider um, uh, academic community uh, that, that works uh, on this important question. Um, so with that, let's move uh, to our second aim. Uh, apart from doing research, uh, we also seek to make as much data freely available um, um, as a service uh, to the research field. And, and this work consists of two parts. Uh, one part, in one part of it, we collect all freely available data um, on quality of government. So this is a massive database that you can access uh, freely from our website. Um, we have a standard data set uh, over time and cross section. Uh, we also have uh, an OECD data set and a regional database that collects a lot of very useful uh, statistics on European countries. Um, and also, uh, apart from that, we also collect our own data. And, and, and you're going to hear today about one part of our own data collection, uh, namely the European Quality of Government Index, which is a large scale uh, regional level survey uh, that was conducted uh, the first time in 2010. Uh, we're going to talk about the latest round of this survey, 2021 um, survey. And, and, and the nice thing about doing this over a number of years, it's not only that we are able to move at the regional level and hence a more specific level uh, and perhaps a more relevant level for most citizens. And citizens tend to encounter uh, governments in their interaction uh, with service providers in education, health, law enforcement, etc. cetera. Um, uh, so, so I'm going to hand over at this stage to Nicholas, who is going to walk us through the main results um, of our survey. Um, thanks again. I'm very much looking forward uh, to questions, comments, and discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Monica and uh, Pavel and Barbara for helping organize this, uh, this nice conference. Uh, and thanks to everybody who's in the audience. This is a, this is a really great opportunity to share some of this work with, with all of you. Uh, I'd also like to echo uh, the sentiments toward your, your neighbor as well. It is strange to give a sort of uh, presentation such as this uh, in this time, but uh, yes, I, I agree with what Monica said. These, these types of discussions, I think, are, are very important and very relevant to what's, what's happening uh, in, in Ukraine today. Um, so with this in mind, um, I just would give a, a quick overview of what I'll discuss uh, in the remainder of our time, just giving you a bit of the background and motivation of the data collection, um, kind of take you through a little bit what the quality of government index is, what it's made of, the survey questions, um, and how we kind of how we kind of build the index, uh, along with uh, just some basic observations that we've made. Like Monica said, we now have four years, uh, four waves of this data uh, over the course of eleven years. So. We have a little bit of uh, time data to work with, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the things we can observe with the data. And then if there's time, we'll get into a little bit of the kind of correlates and, and, and possible causes of, of regional uh, quality of government. Um, so uh, just a little bit of the, the, the background um, <coughs> in, in, in kind of constructing this and like why we're measuring regional level quality of government to begin with. Well. I mean, it's, it's clear when you start looking at data of kind of human well-being, um, the indicators that Monica was talking about in the beginning, things like poverty and GDP. If you, if you go past the country level, you see a lot of variation within countries, right? So if, 
If we're looking at GDP per head within Europe, we see that this varies considerably within, within a lot of countries. In some countries, maybe not so much, but in places like Spain, Italy, France, um, uh, a number of other places, Germany, we see sizable variations in, 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 in wealth. Uh, we see variation within countries in terms of female achievements, uh, gender equality measures in terms of um, political and economic opportunities for women. And, and even life expectancy within countries. Um, so the idea here basically is that if, if, we, if we think development is tied to institutions uh, across countries, well, we should probably be, be concerned about this within countries as well. And, and the starting point, the motivation for, for building an index uh, was to give a little bit of, uh, was to give a little bit of support to the expansion of how we think about uh, kind of subnational development uh, within countries. Um, and until very recently, uh, if you look at the research, economic research and policy recommendations in terms of how we, we understand uh, the promotion of regional development, it's basically anchored in very kind of uh, a little bit older thinking in terms of infrastructure investments, human capital investments, labor and innovation. And there's nothing wrong with these investments, but it, it certainly overlooks uh, some very important factors, namely, um, uh, <clears throat> namely, namely institutions, as we'll get to. But um, these, in, these, these, these types of investments uh, in infrastructure, human capital, and labor. I mean, the European Union has been has been investing in now in 25, 30 years, and it's and it's cer certainly benefited some regions. And you can see the development of, of namely capital regions in places like Poland and Romania and Slovakia, the Czech Republic, where we have seen a, 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 a sharp development uh, spike over, over time. But a lot of regions, not just in the newer countries, but even in, the, even in Southern Europe, uh, have not benefited very much from all of these investments and these types of things. Uh, and this is like what, what some argue has, has helped lead to geography of discontent. And that is regions that are sort of stuck in, a, in more or less a, a, a trap, so to speak, a development trap. And, and this helps... Uh, this helps kind of motivate many people's reasoning for supporting populist parties or anti-democratic parties and, and, and seeking solutions to, to sort of discontent outside of the system. And so these are things that we need to be uh, focused on. So the, the sort of shift to, to looking at institutions and, and by institutions, we're talking about kind of rules of the game, uh, enablers of, of, of innovation and, and things like this. And and it's a, it's a turn in, in, in terms of European development as well and looking at these strategies. Um, so which institutions matter? Uh, and, and this is obviously a very difficult, uh, controversial topic. Uh, what should we look at? Formal institutions, informal institutions. And, and a big part of this, this reasoning for, for the European Quality Government Index which we'll, which we'll get to in a, in a bit, was, was to really focus on kind of the, the informal ways that we, that we practice power uh, within, within countries and obviously within regions. But if we thought that formal institutions were the sort of solution to better governance, to better development, then we, then we wouldn't see such drastic variation in places like Italy, right? I mean, they have the same sort of rule of law, they have the same media freedoms, they have the same kind of electoral laws, uh, and you and you think if those things and a number of other country level kind of institutions, formal institutions were enough, we wouldn't see the variation that we see uh, in this country. And this is just an example map of the 2013 data that we have. Uh, and because we see these these large variations in some cases in terms of corruption perceptions, corruption experiences, uh, we I, we argue we have to go beyond kind of formal institutions and try to gauge the way that. That, that informal uh, power is practiced. And so this is what we're getting at in terms of quality of governments. Um, and as Monica said, we're interested in things like impartiality, uh, the, the, the way in which people are treated equally, uh, low corruption, uh, and, 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 and it's kind of how, how standard operating procedures are, are practiced or informal practices in formal institutions. And of course, these are super difficult to measure. This is not an easy thing to do at all. It's not uncontroversial. Um, and it's clearly endogenous uh, or related with other causes and outcomes of development. 
And as we'll see here, uh, you know, as we as we can see from the country level data and even our data in the 11 years we have, these are very sort of strongly path dependent um, factors that don't change a whole lot from year to year. Uh, but we would argue, and and you know, uh, Andres uh, Rodriguez Pose, one of the leading uh, economic geographers today um, in in economics, argues that the quality of government is as important, if not more. Than variations in, in human capital endowment and innovation capacity for development of regions. And, and sort of, I think he presents this very nicely, that quali low quality of government is like a bottleneck to development. And so these kinds of things are, are, are very important to, to understand. And then our task is then to kind of gather data and try to map out what this looks like. So how, what is regional quality of government? Can we measure it? Uh, the causes and consequences, and these are all very large questions. But um, I will just say just a brief background in terms of our process and how we've uh, arrived at the data today. When we started this project in 2010, 2009, this was extremely controversial to talk about things like corruption uh, and, and low impartiality in, in many uh, EU circles. Uh, we, would, we would get a lot of opposition. Our first round of the 2010 data, for example, uh, was blocked uh, from being published in the European Union's uh, European Commission's cohesion report because uh, members from Romania and Bulgaria did not like the results. So there was political opposition to the data being published in the name of the Commission. Uh, thankfully, since then, uh, there was uh, there is increased support across all member states uh, enough so that now the EU has published uh, statements such as the quality of public institutions has a major impact on social and economic development at the regional level. And the commission uh, has, has really sort of changed or is changing uh, some of its expenditures and investments in the regions, uh, making sure that things like administrative capacity uh, are, are now invested in, and now investing in, in measures such as ours and a number of other kind of indicators that help people understand Kind of what this looks, what what regional quality of government looks like across space and time, so that we can identify regions that um, are performing well and performing less well, uh, and that's what we're talking about today in terms of the case studies as well. So, this is a this is a this is a nice development at the at the commission level, uh, but still lots of work to do. So. Since the 1990s, many of you have probably heard of these national level indicators, the ones like Transparency International produces, the World, Go the World Bank has their world governance indicators, and there's lots and lots of national data uh, across countries that we can use to compare things like corruption or rule of law, these types of indicators that are very related to what we're talking about. But prior to 2010, there was very, very little uh, data at all uh, for researchers uh, at the regional level. And so the DG Regio at the commission uh, helped um, invest in, in a pilot study, uh, the Quality of Government Index in 2010. And we've done uh, this again in 13, 17, and, and 2021. So we have um, four rounds. We are the only, I guess, to, to my knowledge, kind of multi-country subnational data on quality, on quality government concepts uh, to date. Uh, it's a composite index for 200 plus regions uh, in Europe, in all EU countries. Uh, we mainly focus on the NUTS 2 level, uh, with the exception of Germany and Belgium, where we have the NUTS 1, but otherwise we have what we call the NUTS 2 level um, in, in, across all countries. And I'll show you maps what that looks like in case you are unclear what that is. But uh, the data is based largely on citizen survey of respondents in the EU. So a lot of the data that the Transparency International and the World Bank uh, offers are based largely on expert surveys. So expert assessments of how uh, the country is working or performing. And ours is, uh, turns it around and bases on, on the citizen perspective instead. Uh, and we think this is a, a good way of measure, doing this because it's, um, it avoids kind of the feedback loops that many of the expert surveys could be subject to uh, citizens probably have not heard a lot of these indicators and therefore like the, the bandwagoning on, on previous results is less likely, we would argue. And plus we are very, we're simply interested in the way the citizens um, 
experience their public services. Uh, so we argue that quality of government is a multidimensional concept. We include uh, the, the sub concepts of impartiality, uh, the extent to which people are treated fairly um, in, in, in public service allocation by the state, corruption, uh, defined as the public uh, abuse for private gain, and the quality and effectiveness of, of, of public services. So we, we include these three pillars. Uh, and like I said, this is about the informal ways that power is exercised rather than the, the de jure institutions. Um, and so that's what we're, we're getting at here. Um, we're now in our fourth round. Uh, we have roughly 30 questions in the EQI survey. Uh, we, we'd say 16 to 19 of them are kind of the core uh, quality of government items uh, where we focus on um, three primary uh, public services. They, these are education, uh, healthcare, and, and law enforcement. Uh, we also cover electoral fairness perceptions. Uh, and we focus on these because education, healthcare, law enforcement, um, these generally are, are administered maybe even financed um, at the subnational level in most countries. Of course, there's a lot of variation, like what regions have what kind of authority, depending on the country. But on average, most of the countries have at least one of these services where the regions that we're sampling at have uh, administrative control over these. So we expect regional variation uh, uh, on these factors. Of course, there's other institutions that we could look at, but uh, we, we expect them to be less variation, things like uh, defense and things like this, or, or customs. I mean, we would expect these to be more national um, institutions. So we include um, things like demographic questions, uh, trust in institutions, a number of other things for research purposes. But our core questions mainly focus on these. Um, and then we ask, um, we gauge the citizens' perceptions and, 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 and experiences with, with corruption, impartiality, and quality. Uh, most of our questions have to do with, with perceptions, like, you know, sort of citizens rating their institutions on these three uh, items of, of corruption, impartiality, and quality. Uh, and then we also ask a number of questions about citizens' experience with things like petty corruption. And in the latest round, we have a question about vote buying. So uh, both perceptions and experiences go into our, our, our index. Uh, we ask mainly, in the previous round, uh, we asked mainly via phone. Uh, and in the latest round, we split the administration online and, uh, and on telephone. And this is for cost reasons, as well as um, reaching uh, certain demographics that are getting more difficult to reach by phone, <laughs> uh, namely young people. Um, the sample uh, prior to this year was all uh, member states with at least two nuts, two regions. Uh, we used to have the UK. We no longer have the UK due to Brexit. So we have all now uh, EU 27 member states in 2021. It's the largest sample that we have. And I'll show a little bit more of that in a, in a moment. Um, so our questions, how do, we, how do we measure quality of government specifically? What's, how do we do this in a concrete way? Um, so I'll just take you through some of the questions that we asked the respondents in our survey. Um, we start off with a number of questions about uh, if they've had contact with their services in the last 12 months. And then we, and then we ask uh, some questions about, the, about rating the quality of services. Uh, how would you rate the quality of public education, healthcare, uh, police force in the area where you live? Um, and we ask area where you live because... Uh, so many of the, the regions at the nuts two level in the European Union are not so meaningful. So we can't ask, uh, you know, somebody in Romania or Sweden, for example, uh, the regional name because it doesn't mean anything to, to many people. In some places, this, this, this would mean something like in Germany or Italy, but in, in many cases, it doesn't. So we, we, we keep the, the phrase where you live to offer consistency across the countries. And this is just a, a sense of, of what we find uh, between 27 and 2021. If we look at the combined levels of, of quality across regions, um, uh, those are just the country or regional abbreviations, but you can see the, the Finnish region of Oland is very at the top in both, in both 2017 and 2021. 
and a number of um, kind of Romania, Southern Italy, um, at the very, very bottom of quality perceptions. Uh, and these are, these are very sticky, as I said. Um, uh, impartiality, this is, a, this is a slightly more difficult uh, concept to measure um, than, than quality, for example, um, where we can't ask somebody how impartial do you think something is because that's a, that's a complex term. So we just ask about things like special advantages, uh, whether people agree that certain people get special advantages in their public institutions. And then we have a, a second set of questions um, where we sort of flip the concept around, so to speak, and we ask the degree to which people uh, agree or disagree that all citizens are treated equally uh, in public education and, and healthcare and things like this. So if we take a look at those across regions, we also see uh, very kind of consistent over time uh, and, and uh, you know, a number of uh, uh, similar cases here, Bulgaria, Romania, Southern Italy, kind of low on impartiality regions from Austria, uh, Denmark, Finland, very, very high on, on impartiality. Um, corruption, uh, these, these are much more common questions uh, in surveys than impartiality. Uh, there's a number of uh, other, other outlets that ask people about perceptions of corruption. Ours are a little bit more specific in terms of asking about certain services. Uh, and we also ask uh, more general questions, what we call kind of need and greed corruption, where we ask people to agree if uh, people must use corruption in some form just to get some basic public services, whether it's sort of a need factor uh, and, and the degree to which people believe that corruption is about greed, people trying to use uh, their access to get unfair privileges and wealth. So we ask five uh, perceptions questions. Um, and this is the, the combined for regions here, you can see, um, and I'll take you a little bit more into the, the findings of corruption just because um, it's a little bit more of a uh, understandable, I guess, uh, metric than say maybe impartiality. But we, uh, if, we, if we take the, the, the country level, just to give a little bit easier presentation, these are the perceptions of the citizens. Um, uh, across countries uh, in Europe for our latest data, we see that Croatia, Bulgaria, Romania tend to have uh, the highest perceptions of corruption across our five items, whereas Finland, Denmark, Germany, Luxembourg, uh, the lowest perceptions of corruption. Um, if we look at the experts' assessments uh, and the citizens' perceptions, uh, they look pretty similar. They're, they're not so different. Uh, so this is an interesting uh, uh, scatter plot where we have the World Bank um, uh, combined assessments for, for 2019 on the, on the x-axis and our data of citizens' perceptions um, on the y-axis. And we see they're, they're, they're very highly correlated. Uh, there's some countries where the citizens tend to like over rank the, 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 the perceptions of corruption relative to the experts, places like Hungary, for example, the citizens think that things are much less corrupt than the experts. Um, and then you get a set of countries below the line where the reverse is the case. But in general, we get a similar order if we rank the countries by either citizen or, or expert assessments. Um, we can also see over time that the, corrupt, the corruption perceptions have gone down in our latest round. So what's very interesting um, about the 2021 round that we, were, that we were very kind of worried about was the impact of COVID-19 on the perceptions of institutions. And one thing that we see uh, almost uniformly is that the perceptions of institutions have, have gotten better since 2017. And so perceptions of corruption have gone down in almost every single country uh, from our latest round. Uh, and we can see here just the overall trend uh, of perceptions of corruption, which, we, which reached a very high level in 2017. This is just across all European regions. And now in 2021, it has gone down uh, just under where it was in 2013. So this is actually sort of, sort of a positive trend. If, if you look at maybe one of the silver linings of the last two years is that people maybe think their institutions are working a little bit better. They're seeing them in action, so to speak. Um, if we look at the experience-based questions, uh, this is how we measure these. Uh, and we just ask uh, the, whether somebody has in their, in their family or themselves in the last 12 months have been asked uh, to, to, by a public official, 
to give an informal gift or bribe in any of our services. And we also turned the question around and asked if they did give that uh, informal gift or bribe. So we asked if you've been approached and we asked if you have um, given that informal payment or bribe. And we use the word bribe uh, in, directly because we want to signal this is what we're talking about, uh, although it probably has some implications. Um, these are just sort of the big trends uh, across uh, the, the older and newer member states. Clearly, we can see that, that healthcare, for example, is the service in which people most uh, likely report uh, having direct uh, bribe experience. We see that uh, the other services, education, uh, law enforcement, and other tend to be a little bit lower, although education is, is a little bit higher uh, in some years. Uh, and that we see a clear divide between newer and older member states. Uh, so in the more Eastern Central, uh, we see that in particular healthcare, along with some others, we see some much higher rates than we see in, in sort of Western and in particular Northern Europe. Uh, yet we see overall the trends in, in corruption experiences by citizens uh, takes a very, very uh, steep decline going down uh, considerably in 2021 to the lowest uh, level that we've seen. And this, of course, is because a lot of the, the services were closed down or restricted. So um, that also may be a silver, silver lining. And so we see this in, in pretty much every country um, with, with, with some very, very small exceptions that the experiences with corruption uh, have dropped since uh, the last round in 2017. So uh, big, big drops in almost all countries with people reporting uh, direct experiences with, with corruption. Uh, and if we look at the regions, same, same thing. I mean, we see that the overwhelming number of, of regions, uh, the citizens report much, much lower uh, corruption experiences, which um, is, of course, a positive thing. Um, these these uh, trend lines are just uh, the, the, the particular services in question. We can see, generally speaking, the healthcare uh, services is, is the most prominent that people have experiences with. Education has ticked up a little bit, but like I said, all services are sort of in decline from 17 to 21. Um, so just briefly, and if you have some questions about uh, how we take all of those questions and put them into a single number, uh, this is more or less the roadmap of how we do it. So we have our quality questions, we have our impartiality questions, we have our corruption questions, uh, and, and we take the survey data, we aggregate these questions to the regional level. Uh, we weight them uh, with post stratification weights. We combine them into pillars. And then we center our pillars on the word governance indicators uh, so that we can kind of anchor the regional estimates in a national context and account for the things that we didn't really uh, question about. Uh, we just question about these three services. Obviously, there's lots of other services. So we, uh, we arrive at a final index like this. And I'd be glad to answer any questions about the more methodological things in the discussion, but I'll just sort of keep it at that for now. Um, like I said, our sample uh, is the largest one we've had so far. We uh, have 127,000 uh, respondents in our latest uh, rounds. Uh, we, have, we have sampled in all countries for the first time. So even the smaller countries like Malta, and, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, we have now uh, sampled. Uh, and if we combine all of our data, we have 300 and nearly 330,000 respondents. Um, so we also, on our website that Monica talked about, we publish the micro data as well. So you can use some of these uh, data for a number of purposes, the regional level or even the micro data for, for, your, for your research, if you're interested. So these are the results, uh, the maps um, of the quality of government index at the regional level. Like I said, these are nuts too. Uh, in most all cases, uh, with the exception of Germany and Belgium. So you can see what the regions look like at the NUTS2 level. This was our first round where the, uh, the blue regions are above the, the European mean and the red regions are below the European mean. Um, uh, and you can see a, a pretty clear divide between kind of east-west, maybe north-south in this. This is the next round uh, where we measured, this is 2013. 
uh, same goes. So the darker the region, the more extreme. So the Swedish Finnish are like the highest, uh, you can see here, Romania, Southern Italy, kind of the lower end and the, the lighter pink and the lighter blue are kind of more in the middle, but on either side of the mean respectively. Uh, this is 2017, our data. Uh, and then this is our latest round. Um, and so you can see clearly we don't have the, the UK anymore because of, of Brexit. Now we just have the EU 27, but this, uh, this map looks a, a little bit different in terms of um, the geography of this. And I'll talk about that in just one minute, but this is our latest uh, results that we're basing today on. Uh, just a quick couple of observations that we make uh, over time. Like what have we kind of observed now that we have four rounds of the data? Um, well, we observe just like the country level data that this is very, very sticky. Like I said, these are sort of more path dependent um, phenomena and the measures reflect this. So we see correlations uh, over, over across all years at above 0.9 uh, at the regional level, very, very highly, highly correlated. So they are, they are sticky things that, are measure, that we're measuring here, um, which is both a positive and a negative, I suppose. Um, the, the, uh, the EQI shows uh, very strong internal validity uh, and, and good external validity to the degree we can assess this. The internal pillars of quality, impartiality, and, and corruption all correlate at at least 0.88 with each other at the regional level. And then we also see that our measure is correlated with, um, you know, possibly rival measures or complementary measures like the OECD has a measure of per perceptions of corruption. Our measure is very correlated with this. Uh, the degree to which you know there's single bidding in, in procurement, uh, which is a proxy for corruption uh, risk, our measure is, is 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 correlated with this, and and measures of perceptions of meritocracy in the public sector, and then things like you know human development, GDP per capita, life expectancy, uh, social trust, and our measure is not correlated at all with with like area or population. So that's, those are things we wouldn't expect and they're not correlated with this. So it speaks to some validity of the measure, we would argue. There's also, um, we also check to see uh, if our, if our if changes in the quality of government at the regional level are also correlated with changes in things like unemployment, GDP per capita, uh, poverty. And we find out that they, they are to, to, to a large degree that, that, that we see, you know, shifts in these things travel with quality of government, whereas things like population um, uh, do not, right? So uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting finding. So geography still matters, of course, like these are measures are very sticky um, in EQI 2010. One thing we notice is there's a really clear east-west divide. Um, and, and we still see this in, in, in 2021, but it's, it's less important than it was before. We see uh, namely that uh, Southern, European country, Southern European regions are sort of uh, getting, getting lower on the measure. And then places like Estonia, Lithuania, some regions um, in, in Czech Republic, Slovenia have, have you know, arrived at the European mean or exceeded the European mean. Um, so this is, this is quite interesting. Whereas Northern European regions are more or less very, very similar. Uh, we see that countries with, with higher uh, quality of government tend to have less regional variation than, uh, than countries with, with lower quality of government. Um, and so we see, generally speaking, this does not correspond with things like federalism, like we see in Austria, Germany, for example, not so, not so much regional variation, whereas places like Romania, um, at certain years, Bulgaria, um, even Croatia, I mean, will have relatively high levels of, of, of regional variation. Um, and so we see these, these interesting trends here. The, 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 the countries at the top tend to have uh, more uniform scores, where there's more re regional variation at the, at the middle and the bottom. Uh, another very interesting finding is that within countries, uh, linguistically diverse, uh, sometimes smaller regions uh, with more distinct identities tend to have better scores. 
Uh, and so the region of Oland, which is uh, circled at the top, is like the most uh, prominent case of this. It's like the highest quality of government every year. And then regions like Britannia in France and, and, and Basque region in Spain, uh, Bolzano Trento in Italy, uh, the region that we'll hear more about today, Opolsky in, in Poland, especially Holstein, uh, Friesland. Uh, we used to have Scotland in the, me in, the, in the measure that used to be part of this discussion. It's no longer, but um, uh, the, the Hungarian region of, of uh, uh, Centru in Romania also fits this. So this is also an interesting finding um, that we, we see this. Um, some countries have very persistent gaps in their quality of government across regions. I'm thinking about countries like Italy, where we see, you know, the same, you know, regions at the top every year, the same regions at the bottom every year, and that these gaps are, are, are very wide, uh, over two standard deviations uh, in the data uh, every year, um, and in some years even more. Uh, Belgium is a very similar case where we see um, the region of Flanders, the Dutch speaking region, uh, always at the top, the Brussels region always at the bottom, and then Walloon, the French region in the middle. Um, some countries we see uh, regional convergence, the regions are getting closer. Um, we see this in the case of, of Portugal, for example, where there used to be more uh, regional diversity, and in the latest couple of years, it's getting the regional diversity is getting smaller. Whereas in a place like Spain, the, we see a lot more regional diversity than we used to. So we see pretty consistent places like the Pais Vasco, the Basque country at the top, but it's getting kind of better in our rankings. And then the countries, the, the regions at the bottom are, are sort of dropping out even further. So the spread is getting larger in places like Spain, even in a place like Poland, uh, which doesn't have a whole lot of regional variation according to our measure, the, the spread is getting wider. Um, and overall, the, the quality of government uh, uh, measures are going down in, in, in Poland. So that's, that's, we, we see a larger spread in 2021. Uh, and finally, on what we observe here, we see that, that, that past quality of government uh, is related with, with perceptions of, of COVID-19. And we asked a number of questions on the survey about people's kind of worries, economic worries, health worries, uh, and we see, for example, um, oh, this is a measure of impartiality, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, we see, for example, uh, that perceptions of corruption in 2017 at the regional level uh, are very, very negative, negatively related with, with people's um, uh, worry of COVID-19. So, uh, so the regions that have uh, lower perceptions of corruption, places like Finland and, and Netherlands, for example, uh, those regions tend to have uh, lower economic worry due to COVID-19. And that's, that's an interesting link, I would argue. Um, I don't know how much, do I have much time to go to the next section, Pavel, or should I stop for questions? No, please uh, continue. Okay, okay, I go another five minutes or so, yeah. So it's interesting, uh, we've taken stock a little bit about um, the way in which our data has been used uh, in, by, by researchers, by people in the in mainly economics, economic geography, political science. Um, and so uh, we've taken a little stock of the, of the findings um, using our quality of government data at the regional level. And what we can see here is that um, uh, the quality of government uh, am among European regions is, uh, is, is argued to be linked with better economic growth, lower informal economy, uh, stronger business creation, uh, efficient use of uh, EU funds, um, smart specialization, gender equality, uh, social capital, social trust, lower support for populist parties, and uh, less antibiotics uh, consumption. And so these are very; th these are the kinds of things we would expect. But it's uh, it's it's sort of nice to see that the that people in, in, in the field have gone out and tested this uh, at the at the regional level within countries, uh, and in some cases over time as well. So just to see here, I mean, the the measure is related with the Human Development Indi Indi Index, uh, the one that Monica talked about in the beginning of the presentation uh, that combines GDP, uh, education, and 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 health. Uh, although it's not the same thing, right? We, we, we 
we, we think that our measure is a distinct concept than, than development. And so it is, uh, it's related, but it's not, not the same. Um, this is a measure of social trust uh, and the European Quality of Government Index, also very related. Places with higher quality government have higher social trust. This is a patents, um, applying for, for patents, which is a measure of uh, kind of innovation in a region. Uh, we see that this is very highly related with, with quality of governments um, uh, at the regional level. Uh, antibiotic consumption uh, in terms of corruption in the healthcare sector are also negative related. So places where there's less corruption in the healthcare sector or perceived uh, corruption, they tend to uh, use less antibiotics. That's a very interesting uh, finding as well. And then uh, happy life expectancy, we also see is uh, positively related with, with the QI. So I'll just, I'll conclude with a couple of, uh, of, of, of thoughts about this. This is obviously a really, really complicated uh, kind of discussion, but the idea about how, sort of how do we get it? Now, we, now we've measured it. We've shown some consequences of this uh, in terms of uh, you know, trust, growth, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, a number of other factors, but like the, quite the, the real question is like, how do we how do we arrive at this? How do how do regions that have low quality government get better? Um, and so it's it's an extremely complex uh, question, and and I mean the research uh, has shown that historical legacies from even hundreds of years ago play a real role in explaining variation today. I mean uh, Guido Tabellini has a has an article that, that talks about sort of past institutions from hundreds of years ago on constraints of the executive at the regional level, explain, you know, values and trust today. And, and, and Victor Lapuente and I have a paper where we explain uh, regional variation in quality of government with a similar measure of past executive constraints on regional leaders from going back into 1700s. And, and, and they explain patterns today to a large degree. So it means these things are really, really sticky. We don't see any sort of uh, relationship with things like electoral systems, like how you know votes translate into seats, ethno-linguistic fractionalization, like diversity of regions. Some diverse regions perform well, some diverse regions perform less well. There's no systematic relationship. Like how long parties are in power doesn't seem to matter. Partisanship doesn't seem to matter, whether it's left or right. Uh, these things are, are less important. What we find that's important, at least from our research, I'll just highlight um, several factors that we that we think are, are uh, you know, on the checklist. Of course, every region is different, but um, if we had to kind of summarize some of the findings, things like universal education, universal welfare, welfare state programs in general, uh, we would argue are, are really important uh, to build this sort of safety net, to get people invested, to get people to, to, to pay taxes and to think their tax money is, is going to something which leads to more accountability and watch watching what the government is doing. Um, and also the, the feeling that everybody's benefiting from the state um, in terms of, of social safety nets. Um, professional systems of taxation and auditing we think are very important. Civil society and public engagement are very, very important factors. Gender equality, probably one of the most, the strongest factors that we see uh, in terms of uh, lower corruption across countries, regions, even municipalities, where there are higher female rates of participation, there are lower rates of corruption and higher rates of quality government. And the relationship is probably complicated, but we see those two very, they, they travel together. And then meritocracy in the public uh, and civil services. Um, uh, so, so, so professional hiring practices, things like this, we argue are very important. Um, and there's a map of this. So uh, that's that's the quality of government in brief. Uh, thank you very much, Dziękuję. That's my extent of my Polish. Uh, and so, thanks for your attention. I look forward to a nice discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Monica. Thank you so much, Nicolas. That was a nice introduction to the uh, topic and like the very, very deep uh, descri descri description of the study and the methodology. And uh, we have like five minutes for the uh, question and answers. Uh, I'm also uh, looking at the chat and I see we have two, two three questions by two uh, colleagues. However, I would like to divide those into the one which is like the uh, belonging to the question and answers round. So quick question 
And the one which is deeper by Professor Krzysztof Gorlach that will go to the uh, general discussion and it will be asked uh, at first, because this will be also, this, the, those questions are also related to the, the, the next presentation we'll have uh, today. Uh, but uh, I have uh, one question from Titus Banner. I don't know if you, you would like uh, to ask your question in person. Yes. Um, Thank you. Yes. Thank you. The question is very simply, um, since I'm not, uh, con not um, familiar with the, with the scientific con concept of uh, quality of government, I was wondering, from, from my understanding, quality of government is um, equally related to efficiency of government. How long do I wait for a decision? How responsive are uh, government agencies, etc.? And I don't find this aspect at all in your research. So I was just wondering if it is included. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if I see him, I will give you the, the floor, but uh, I don't see more questions. I have one. Uh, I have one uh, just for the, the discussion, uh, but this is like the strictly related to the, 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 uh, the definition and the, the approach to the uh, quality of governance, because we've seen on the one of the uh, charts that there is like the uh, the quality of, of governance index in the Warszawski Stowarzyszenie in Poland uh, region, which is like the capital region, is like very low. So I'm wondering how is like the, about the sample, how is the individual perception of in the given region is influencing the index? Like I'm referring to this uh, assessment of the quality of governance in the Warszawski Stowarzyszenie region. This is like the lowest in Poland. Uh, is it related to the social, do you, how do you think it's related to social expectations uh, and very strict assessment of administration in those region or like that it could be related to the bigger influence of uh, uh, like the, the, the reference of this region to the central governance and like the overall assessment of the quality of governance in Poland. So like uh, Warsaw, capital, central government uh, related uh, issue. So how do you think, uh, how does it influence the, 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 uh, the index and the results? Uh, and why Warsaw uh, capital region is like the so low? So this is the technical question also. also. And let, let us ask our uh, colleagues to answer them. If you would like to ask another technical short question, then the, the, I'll be waiting for it. So, Nicholas and Monica. Can we start uh, with the first one that I also think is an excellent question. Thanks a lot. Um, um, so so on, on the concept of, of efficiency, I think that um, you're absolutely right that, that it, they are closely related, quality of government and efficiency. It was not included in our basic definition, but it is actually somehow included in our, our European quality of government index. Because I think that if you ask citizens about the quality of public services, there is some part of, of the efficiency. It's very difficult to imagine citizens answering that the survey is of high quality if, if they cannot access it or if they if they don't think that it, it's done it, it efficiently. But, but in terms of their theoretical motivation, I guess for not including efficiency as one of our main concepts here is that we want to be able to study how also impartiality can impact efficiency. It is possible to imagine very efficient government institutions that are deeply corrupt. Or, or highly discriminatory. And we want to open for that possibility also to study the relationship between the two. Um, but I think that also in, in practice, they also oftentimes actually go together. So if we look at this empirically, we find that, 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 that governments that are able to provide impartial services also oftentimes do this um, uh, in a highly efficient way. Um, but I guess this is some kind of, it ultimately builds on some kind of roles and the idea on that, on, on, on utility um, uh, always coming second uh, to rights. Uh, so I think that is the reason uh, why we did not include it in our, you know, main definition of quality of government. But it sort of lingers there, and it's it's in it's in our data, uh, if if nothing else. So so uh, I think it, that it's very difficult to imagine that citizens would answer this without any sort of connection uh, to efficiency. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, uh, Nicholas. 
Yeah, no, I, 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 that's how, that's how I think we think about it. I think that there's, I mean, the world governance indicators uh, include this measure of government effectiveness uh, in their, in their set of indicators for a quality of government. Um, and, and, and I think we, and efficiency is, is sort of under that umbrella. And I think like our, our measure of quality, as Monica said, I think implies uh, possibly efficiency in that. Um, although we are, like I said, like she said, we are interested in like how the informal practices like would affect things like efficiency. We see efficiency maybe as more of a result or an output. And we're maybe more on the step before that and what we're trying to measure. But I see what you're, I certainly see what you're saying. And it's an important part of it. And I think they're very related. Um, but there's, you can imagine some countries like, you know, Germany in the 1930s, very efficient, but probably like uh, very, very not impartial, for example. Um, but, uh, but in terms of the capital regions, that's a super interesting question. And one that we've been thinking a lot about uh, the, the, the three, four of us who have been working on this project for a while, the, the patterns are very, very interesting. So in some cases, like in Poland this year, where we where this is the first time we actually have the Warsaw region. It used to be part of a larger region, and now there's a separate not two region for Warsaw. But Poland, like Romania, uh, like Bulgaria, um, and, and like Slovakia, for example, the capital region is, is the lowest uh, in in terms of quality of government. Uh, so we see Bucharest every year lowest in terms of quality government uh, on our measure uh, for Romania, for example. And in this year, Poland was the same. Um, and so if you look at the, the data, the, the, the measures of quality, for example, perceptions of quality of services are not any different than any other region. In fact, they're somewhat higher. Where it really ranks low is perceptions of, of corruption. And so there, there's a very, very, I mean, so those, the Warsaw region, the Bucharest region, they're, they're, they're considerably lower. And so it drags the score down overall. Um, uh, and then, you know, in terms of corruption experiences, I mean, these are large cities, there's probably more opportunities. So these, these also tend to have higher uh, self-reported briberies than, than the other regions. Uh, and so this is the, this is a very, this is a very interesting finding because they're much more developed regions and you would think that um, they might perform better on our measure. However, if you go to other countries like, Czech Republic or Slovenia or Lithuania, the capital regions are the highest. And, and that's a very interesting puzzle. And so Prague region has been um, among the highest and the, and the highest this year in terms of quality of government. Uh, Ljubljana region is the highest. The Vilnius region in, in Lithuania is the highest. And, and, that, and so I think we need more research to understand why that is, like why certain capital regions, as you said, maybe there's an expectation or a culture in some regions that like, we're just not living up to this, uh, whereas in other places it's not working that way. Uh, we don't. We're not experts in in these these countries' cultures or sort of political climates. So I think like the next round of of, of case studies, I think you've identified uh, some some nice uh, some nice candidates, and these are capital regions uh, in the newer member states. And we we are very, we are also very curious about this. But to answer your question, it's driven mostly. It's driven almost always by the corruption. Uh, perceptions and experiences so yeah thanks a lot thanks a lot okay thank you very much and uh, let's go straight to the second part of our seminar and um, we will uh, now hear uh, listen to the three presentation one introduction and uh, two uh, country uh, case studies uh, so like uh, i would like to invite uh, straight away victor la puente to give us some few words about the uh, introduction to the subnational uh, quality of governance in uh, Poland and in Spain. So, Victor, the floor is yours. Okay, great. I go very slow, but uh, let's see if I... Uh, yeah, now? Okay, thank you. Um, I thank you very much, Pavel and Barbara, for organizing uh, this. Uh, it's uh, it's great uh, meeting you. It's of course very sad that this in these circumstances of a war in a in a neighbor uh, country. Um, and uh, well, I will not talk much uh, because I think uh, you uh, and Barbara and, and Pablo are the ones who who can give uh, more insights of what we uh, have in these uh, qualitative uh, cases. 
But um, the European Commission from early on, they emphasized that uh, as important as having the quantitative overview of, of what's going on, it would be interesting to have a qualitative uh, um, analysis, a study uh, of uh, some cases of some regions that can give us the mechanisms to answer some of the questions actually that have been raised uh, in the debate uh, uh, now. So, so what leads to, to, to quality of, of government, which, are, which is the secret of having a good quality of uh, government? And uh, also, uh, not only this, but uh, every, every round, the qualitative part has become more important because now, as uh, Nicholas has uh, discussed before, there has been a, a lot of evolution in, in, in these cases. So we can also see uh, what explains this, this change or this perceived change in different in different uh, in different uh, regions and um, and and it's 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 very interesting and it is not obvious. I mean, some of us have been asked by some of these uh, uh, regional governments in, to take part in a process to change their quality of, of government. We have. Uh, uh, we have tried to help them in, in some way, uh, uh, but uh, but it is, uh, and they have created uh, parts, uh, departments or agencies within their governments to try to boost um, the, the, these perceptions among citizens and try to fight, uh, try to tackle uh, corruption. But it's not obvious that they have uh, they have um, they have succeed. So. Um, let me very, very briefly present this uh, in in depth uh, um, uh, um, case uh, case studies of uh, of uh, regions. So, uh, for Spain, we have chosen the Basque Country and, and Catalonia, and for Poland, Polski and, and Lubelski. Uh, why? Uh, well, there are different uh, reasons. Uh, we already uh, had studied uh, some Spanish regions and some Polish regions before. Precisely because of that, I think uh, this uh, uh, it's even more interesting to know what's going on now uh, with quality of government. There have been changes in these two in these two in these two countries, Spain and Poland, similar uh, medium-sized economies, one from the east, uh, the other from the west or, or the south, and uh, and it makes you. Uh, um, it makes, uh, uh, I think, a, a nice comparison of, of different <laughs> dynamics. But what surprise, surprised us the most and also has surprised in previous um, studies is that the, the insight seems to be quite similar, quite constant, <laughs> uh, both in terms of the description of the quality of warming in the regions as well as in the, in the, um, uh, in the explanation on what explains those positions of those of those regions and um, the case of Spain is, uh, is particular but at the same time and Nicolas can and uh, Monica can tell more about this but in some way it's also quite uh, well first of all show you the the, 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 the regions the Basque country in Catalonia and Polsky and uh, Lubelski uh, not very far away uh, regions in, 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 in that sense. Um, the, the, this is uh, the Spanish uh, regions. And as I was saying before, uh, Nicolas and, and Monica might, might say more, but, but what we see in, 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 in Spain uh, is also what happens in, it's increasingly happened in other countries. And, and we could call it an Italianization of many countries. In the sense that, uh, well, we all know that Italy presents uh, divergences within Italy, very strong between high performing regions in the north and lower performing regions in southern Italy. That, uh, well, uh, Robert Padnam was the, one of the first ones to point that out in the, in the 1990s uh, and, and pointing out the differences in social capital, I mean, the quality of the institutions. This has been confirmed by numerous studies, and we see that uh, in Italy. Uh, but what we see that is increasingly some divergences in, in many countries. And a country that has Italianized uh, itself quite a lot is the case of, of Spain. You see from 20, 
10, the first round to the last one uh, uh, last year, we see a wider gap between the uh, top performed region, País Vasco or Basque Country, and the lowest performing region, Catalonia or, or, or Catalonia. Uh, these two regions are uh, also the best performing and the worst performing region, again, in perceptions of quality of government. Uh, when you go to some of these regions, the first thing they remind you, especially in Catalonia, is this is only perceptions. Uh, in many other things, we actually rank higher than many other regions uh, um, uh, in Spain. But uh, what you see is a widening gap between these two, these two regions are quite uh, um, constant. So this is particularly passing the, the Spanish comparison. Why? Because both Basque Country and Catalonia are regions with a strong nationalist uh, feelings, with a strong separatist movements. Uh, in Catalonia, has been as uh, is uh, uh, has been popular known uh, worldwide um, and a separatist attempt uh, very uh, very recent in 2017. Pablo will talk more about uh, uh, that, but. Um, but the Basque Country also has had a, a strong separatist movement, in this case a terrorist group for, for many years, and there is a strong separatist feeling in both regions. So both regions are, have their own uh, language, uh, uh, apart from the Spanish. They have, uh, both of them were the first two industrialized regions in Spain, the first two modern regions in, in, in Spain. They, they have been traditionally the two economic uh, powers, the two economic engines of, of Spain and industrial ones, with the two of the highest uh, GDP per capita levels. Um, before Madrid, uh, let's say, has taken over uh, a lot of that in, in recent years. But we see uh, uh, that one is leading in quality of government, the Basque Country, and the other is a uh, lagger, uh, uh, has a very bad. Uh, um, um, way below the country, the country average. Why uh, uh, this uh, is the case, uh, Paolo will talk more, but I would like to, uh, uh, Paolo will provide as good as an answer we can have nowadays, uh, even if it is incomplete. But I think the question, what I would like to point out here is that it's very intriguing. It's a particularly intriguing uh, question, uh, how this divergence uh, uh, not only um, 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 happens, but it's even increasing uh, during uh, uh, across time. And it's, uh, um, again, and, and I would like to emphasize that as um, um, uh, Professor Adres Rodriguez Pozio of the London School of Economics has emphasized, uh, when we look at regional disparities in Europe, we tend to think of very country-based reasons, but we actually see a lot of regional uh, divergences in all countries. So there is something going on worldwide in, 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 in terms of increasing regional differences, and actually that is linked to populist uh, movements in many, in many, in many countries, or, or that some regions are more pro-Brexit and more others more anti-Brexit, like in the in the in, in Britain. So, so there is a, a, a divergence, at least in, 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 in quality of government, that may have a, a, a political consequences because increasingly it seems also that votes are territorialized and some territories tend to vote more for some parties than, uh, than, uh, than others. So it's an interesting puzzle. The, the Polish regions also present, although Pavel will talk more on, on Barbara, but um, um, they present an interesting puzzle. I mean, uh, Opolski was the worst region in the first round of the EQI in 2010, but it's the best region now. So I think a few cases in Europe are more interesting to explore uh, uh, how uh, regions might, might, might change their fate, let's say, in, in quality of government, in, in a stark contrast to what we saw in Spain, which seems that time is consolidating the quality of government here, uh, that we can see a, a change. And as a, as a, as a counterpart, we will have Lubelski, which is the region with the largest fall in the EQI from the previous round, so from 2021 to 2017, uh, it presents the largest fall. So what has uh, happened there uh, in both regions can give us uh, insights from uh, for other regions uh, in Europe. And um, I don't want to be <laughs> to make a spoiler of what Pablo and Pavel and Barbara are going to say, 
But just one, uh, very briefly, I think that when it comes, uh, so, some things in common from, from uh, the four regions, uh, when it comes to the description, so when, when uh, Pavel, Barbara, and uh, Pablo have been asking the experts uh, whether they agree uh, personally and qualitatively with what the quantitative uh, um, um, uh, assessment of the EQI is saying of their regions, normally there tends to be quite a high degree of congruence of consensus among the experts interviewed, interviewed by in these qualitative reports on how on the relative accuracy of the EQI for the regions. Uh, particularly for the low <laughs> EQI regions, the ones with the lowest level of uh, quality of, uh, of government, like in the case of Catalonia, as Pablo reminds in, in, his, uh, in, his, uh, in his report, it's not very clear that uh, many people don't agree so much on the bad position of, uh, in this case, uh, Cat uh, Catalonia. And then when it comes to the explanation on what leads to quality of government, in both the reports, there are these, uh, um, there are many other the factors, but there are these two that have pointed out by Pablo, pa Pavel, and, and Barbara. First, let's say we could call the importance of intangible factors, or uh, the, the idea that the, the high level of trust among the population seems to be important for, for, uh, for uh, the quality of government. So the citizens in some way or another are cooperating, cooperators with a high degree of quality of government. And also uh, experts in the, uh, in the high performing regions, they underline the importance of uh, high level of work ethos among civil servants, not high level of work incentives, but ethos, values, the perception that they are working for 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 the uh, serving the public that seems to be quite important. And uh, last but not least, they also are some similar tangible factors or institutional factors are pointed out by the experts in all regions, and it it is the degree of professionalization of the administration. That is that there are few political appointees. That seems to be key in the high-performing regions for, uh, for providing uh, high levels of, um, of quality of, uh, of uh, government. Um, again, these are insights from very particular regions in remote parts in Europe, but they connect with many of the results that we get nowadays on quality of government. Two weeks ago, the Lancet, uh, in the Lancet, there was an article of what were the, the factors most correlated, most associated with lower um, um, infections and lower mortality due to COVID-19 in the countries. And it was surprising that tangible factors such as expenditure in public health, number of hospital beds per capita and so on, didn't seem to matter, were not statistically correlated with the performance against the pandemic. But these kind of factors like trust among the population, institute, trust of the citizens towards the government, these are kind of things that we are dealing in, in this study were highly correlated and low levels of corruption as well were highly correlated with um, with um, um, lower with a better performance against the pandemic. So, on the top of the things that we have been saying, also as Nicholas has discussed, actually, uh, this seems to be saving lives. And um, I would stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for a nice introduction. And uh, I would like to ask now Pablo Fernandez uh, from Carlos. Third University of Madrid to, to show us and explain, the, uh, tell us a few words about the study or in two Spanish regions, Catalonia and Basque Country. Uh, so Pablo. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share. So, um, well, thank you very much for, for the invitation and, and for to this workshop and, and for the opportunity to work in 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 this in this report it's been uh it's been very enjoyable and i've learned a lot so i'm going to try to uh, share with you some of the insights and some of the findings that i've come across as i was interviewing experts and, and stakeholders in in both of these two spanish regions i've titled the presentation spanish divergence and this is something that both 
Nicholas and, and Victor were alluding to uh, in, their, in, their, in their presentations, because um, Catalonia and Basque country sh show very disparate uh, levels in their, uh, in their quality of, of, of government index. Um, and I'm going to argue that this is to a large extent a, a paradox and it poses some interesting puzzles for, for the future. Um, so let me start with, with a bit of a motivation for why Spain is, is, is to some extent a very interesting uh, case to study because um, if you look at the median uh, region in Spain in terms of quality of government, it's a fairly average performance. It shows a fairly average performance. And if looking at the uh, regional average across regions in Spain over time, over the, the four waves, or at the median region over time over the four waves, the overall performance is fairly, it's fairly constant, it's fairly stable, and, uh, and that median region is pretty much located at the median of all European regions. But what's, what's very, very interesting is, as both Nicholas and, and Victor were saying, is that there is a very high level of cruise regional variance. And not only is it very high, but the, that, that variance, that, um, uh, that variation is, um, is growing over time. So let me show you this first this graph where we have essentially the distribution of regional EQI uh, indices uh, across countries where here countries are ordered according to the performance of the um, median region. Given that we're looking at the distribution of performance, we're here uh, only countries with at least two regions are included. And so in red here, you have the case of Spain. And as you can see, you know, right off the bat is that the, the, the location of Spain uh, within uh, the, the full set of countries is fairly, is fairly uh, cent central or, or, or average, right? So the median Spanish region is, is located at, at, at zero, pretty much. Um, but what's interesting is that together with Italy, which has a significantly lower median percentage or an, an overall um, uh, quality of government uh, performance, Spain has a very wide degree of, of variation, right? So you have some, some uh, regions like the Basque Country, which is actually almost uh, located at, you know, at uh, the index of one. So uh, among the top performance in, performance in, in, in the overall um, set of regions, whereas uh, Catalonia is doing much, much worse. And borrowing a graph that uh, Nicholas had, has used in, in his presentation, these, uh, this dispersion in the, in the performance of, of Spanish regions has been widening. As you can see here, the Basque country uh, has been a top for performer, uh, so where, sorry, País Vasco, like the, the, the top one on the, on the, on the, on the far left, um, on the top left, sorry, um, is, is what it's the Basque country in, in Spanish. And it's has been the top performer in most uh, in most waves. Catalonia, on the other hand, which is the the bottom one in 2010, is also the bottom one in 2021. But the distance between the two has grown. Um, so geographically, um, this is their location. This is uh, something that Victor was uh, showing as well. So these are both northern regions, uh, peripheral regions, relatively far from from the capital, Madrid. Um, and so what I think is one of the most interesting uh, aspects of studying these two regions is that there is quite a paradox uh, to the extent that these are two regions that share substantial commodities. Their performance, their performance in the study is very different. And yet when we look historically at their performance in, at their economic performance and other structural characteristics of these regions that are very similar. So here I've listed a few of these. Uh, these two regions were the early industri industrializers in Spain, uh, starting in the mid uh, 19th century. Still today, they have they have higher than average GDP per capita compared to the rest of, of the country. Both of them host important uh, ethnic uh, minorities. They have their own regional languages uh, that uh, are very important in the in the uh, educational system. And in terms of their responsibilities, and this is particularly uh, important uh, when thinking about the performance of, 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 of the regions is that the three core areas of, of public policy that, that are included in the, 
in the EQI study, education, health, and public safety. These are uh, mostly in the hands of, uh, of the regions, of the regional governments. There is one key difference, and this is something that is going to come back when, when I summarize the, the opinions of experts, is that of public finance. So the Basque Country has a very unique position together with another region, uh, which is Navarra. Um, and it's unique because uh, the Basque Country essentially has its own tax collection authority. Um, and the Basque Country collects its own taxes and does not transfer any of that money to any other regions, to the, to the poorer regions in the country. So essentially it's self-sufficient. Uh, it has a lot of response, essentially self-sufficient. Uh, and this is something that over time has made it so that uh, the Basque regional governments and the other local governments have a, high, have a very high level of uh, spending on social, uh, higher than, than average spending on, on social services, precisely because they are, they're richer and they're not contributing to, uh, to other regions. And this is very, very different to the case of Catalonia, which is, so, which is also a rich, a rich region in, this, in, in the Spanish uh, context, but um, Catalonia does not have its own tax collection authority. And what, what happens is that uh, taxes in Catalonia are collected by the Spanish central IRA, if you, if you allow me to use the, the American term, and Catalonia gets to keep some of those taxes, but part of the funds are, are sent to other regions in Spain that are poor. Um, okay, so just to give you a sense of what is it that uh, was, is the explanandum, the thing that needs to be explained in the performance of these two regions. And, and, uh, and this is something that I used to get the discussion going with, with some of the participants, some of the interviewees, is that if we split the, the, the performance of the regions across the three key dimensions, corruption, impartiality, and, and quality of, 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 of public services, Catalonia in yellow and the Basque Country in, in green clearly have present very different levels of performance. Uh, in red, we have the, the Spanish average. Um, and as you can see, uh, Catalonia has a very low level of perceptions of corruption. The Basque Country does not have very high ones, but still significantly higher than both the Spanish average or Catalonia. And this divergence, wide divergence between the Basque Country and Catalonia applies also to impartiality and to quality. So what we can see from here is that the difference in, uh, in perceived quality of, of government is not, uh, cannot be explained by any single, any single one of these factors. So all of them are contributing to, to this divergence. So it's not that, oh, it's just corruption or it's just impartiality. Overall, there's a very, there's a very consistent and very strong difference in how citizens in these regions see their, their, their governments. Um, so given this very different evaluation that citizens are giving to the performance of, of, of governments in, in these two regions, it, it didn't surprise me, uh, sorry, uh, uh, that the, the stakeholders ha had very, uh, the interviewees had very different assessments of, of these, um, of these, of these uh, scores. So this, the, the participants were uh, 27 in total, uh, 14 of them in, in, in Catalonia and 13 in the Basque Country. And uh, I conducted in-depth interviews with, with all 27 of them. And when asked about their overall evaluation of uh, their, the, 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 perce the perceived quality of government in their, in their regions, there was a very, Diff, as you can imagine, a very different response. Um, so in the Basque Country, that if you allow me to go back, where citizens seem to be pretty happy with both corruption, not so much with corruption, but better than uh, most Spaniards, but anyway, uh, fairly happy with the partiality of their administration and fairly happy with the quality of government, stakeholders were uh, hmm, there was a wide consensus among the people who, uh, whom I interviewed in the sense that they all agreed that those perceptions really reflect reality. They said like, yeah, some of them were, went as far as saying, yes, you know, in the, Bas in the Basque country, we live really, really well. We have a really high quality of life. Um, 
So, um, in terms of um, uh, the situation in Catalonia, uh, there is a very, essentially, there is a very sharp split in opinions. And this split in opinions about the uh, about the performance of the uh, about the, about the scores and the indicators is it, actually uh, essentially foretells a lot of how experts in Catalonia view the performance in different areas. So in Catalonia, in general opinions among participants were very polarized and very split uh, along very predictable lines. So some the int very interesting thing here is that some participants uh, in Catalonia agreed that the quality of government in that region is low and they were not surprised uh, about the, the perceptions that, that citizens have. Um, these participants that agreed that the quality of government is low tended to be those that are against the push for independence. On the other hand, those that tended to be more sympathetic towards the push for independence had a more, a more suspicious uh, understanding or evaluation of, of those scores. They tended; they were more surprised about them, and they tended to blame those low scores not so much on actual performance, but on um, on the fact that these are just perceptions, and that Catalans would have negative or negative and and, and pessimistic perceptions of the performance of, of of government, mostly because they have higher standards than than the rest, and so that's. It would be higher standards, not actual lower performance. So let me focus on four, um, four key aspects, uh, or four areas that participants tended to focus on. The first one is the political context. The second one is the regional funding, which, it, which I introduced before. The third is public administration. And the fourth is civil society and, and culture. So. Um, in terms of the political context, this is something that I did not, that for, in most interviews, this was a topic or a, or a theme that I need not have to ask about. Like participants were very quick to uh, point fingers or to or attribute responsibility for the scores in quality of government to the political context in the Basque country and in Catalonia. And it's true, at least from the point of view of these participants, that the political context in the Basque country in Catalonia is very different. So if we had to find a word to uh, characterize the political dynamic in the Basque country and the political dynamic in, in, in Catalonia would be harmony in the Basque country and polarization and entrenched conflict in Catalonia. So in the Basque country, why do they, why do they seem to agree that there is there's political harmony? First of all, because the uh, coalition politics in the, in, in, for, for a few years now, has been dominated by centripetal inter-ethnic coalitions. When I mention inter-ethnic, I, I, I mention uh, what, I'm, what I'm alluding to is uh, that parties that defend uh, the population that is Basque speaking, that tend to be more nationalistic, are in coalition in, in the regional government with a Spanish a, a, a Spanish-wide party, like the Socialist Party, which is, uh, tends to be voted more by those who are Spanish speakers within the Basque country. Uh, and this creates kind of like cons favors consensus in, in the political dynamic. Another very important factor that is pointed out by many participants is the, uh, is the end of ETA terrorism uh, 11 years ago. And uh, third, this is something that I noted, noticed is that no matter who you asked, no matter who the participant was, uh, whether it was a bureaucrat or a politician or someone from from the from um, uh, third sector, any anyway, there was a wide agreement as to the fact. Everybody agreed that the Basque, the political economy model implemented in the Basque country for growth, is very successful. So all across the political spectrum and the social spectrum, people were very happy with how the Basque country is, is, is promoting its own economy and, and social inclusion. In Catalonia, things could not be any more different. Um, first of all, coalition politics. So politics are also dominated by coalitions, but these are not inter-ethnic coalitions. These are ethnic-based coalitions, uh, and that generates centrifugal 
uh, incentives and dynamics where there is a very clear pro-independence or pro-sovereignty coalition that is mostly receives that is heavily voted by those who whose mother tongue is Catalan, uh, and on the other hand, you have uh, the parties that or the, the set of parties that defend uh, that are unionists and defend uh, they want Catalonia to remain in Spain, and they, they tend to be voted at much higher levels by by those in Catalonia who are Spanish speakers or who have Sp Spain as their mother tongue, and very often in the accounts. Uh, given by participants, uh, the, the fact that society is polarized uh, is something that comes up very often. And, and the polarization in society can be um, can be seen as at least as far back as 2012, if not if not earlier. Okay, so let me now go point go back to this to this list and. Uh, follow with the, with the question of regional funding. So, as I was saying before, Catalonia contributes to, uh, to the funding of other regions, the Basque country does not. Um, the Basque regional institutions, as a result of not having to contribute, have higher per capita resources to fund services. And this is very important. And this is many, a wide majority of Catalan participants in the, in the interviews, Mm, declare that, they, that the main reason for why uh, the Basque country is performing much better is because they have more money. And indeed, one of the key uh, demands of the of mm, Catalan political parties who favor, uh, who favor independence has been that of the fact that, or they argue at least, that Catalonia is badly mistreated by, um, by Spain in that it doesn't provide Catalonia with enough resources to pay for its services, or it does not invest enough in, in Catalonia. Now, past participants are a bit more uh, point out that having your own tax authority is not guaranteed that you're going to do well, is not guaranteed that you're going to have more money. Indeed, they tend to say, wait, wait a minute, because we have our own regional authority that essentially precludes us from being bailed out uh, by the uh, Spanish federal government. And so, in a way, we're on our own. The way they, they frame this is that since we're on our own, we've, we've had to learn how to manage uh, public services and how to manage finance and how to set taxes in a way that is going to make us self-sufficient. Because anyhow, we would not, we're not going to be bailed out. Um, so essentially, they're saying that having your own um, Catalan, uh, sorry, your own tax authority is no panacea. It's not, it's not, it's not a silver bullet. Essentially saying, well, it's just that we are done, we're managing well, we're doing very well. Um, now, in terms of public administration, uh, there is a, a factor that uh, participants in both regions uh, pointed out is that is the very high proportion of temporary positions uh, in both local and regional administrations. And these are, these are essentially what they say is that for a lot of positions that ought to have been uh, allocated to people with um, essentially permanent contracts, uh, instead of uh, opening calls for, 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 the, for the filling out of these positions through permanent contracts, they're doing these uh, temporary contracts wherein, but that are renovated. So these are people who don't have, who are essentially not, um, don't have employment for life. They're not shielded, um, but at the same time are fulfilling the, the, the responsibilities and the duties of the position for very long. Very long. And the, the, the key thing here is that this introduces a very high risk of politicization. Uh, and this is a problem that is uh, essentially um, that arises both in Catalonia and Basque country. Let me jump first to, the, to this third point, which is that many people that I interviewed uh, indicated that there has been a, a positive advance in transparency, so that there, there's a much higher, much higher level of transparency and transparency requirements in both regions now in 20, 2022 compared to 2010. But many of them were very quick to volunteer that um, 
that the transparency requirements, at least as implemented in Spain, had introduced, had a very dark side, which is that they had significantly increased, oh, sorry, uh, red tape, and that procedures had slowed down. And also that it was stifling innovation. The fact that, uh, that the transparency was stifling innovation, that, that people were scared of, of possible accountability for doing something that does not completely follow the rules. And so essentially that it was overburdening uh, uh, civil servants. A third point that I wanted to raise here because it, it, it was mentioned by several participants is particularly those that are not sympathetic towards the push for independence in Catalonia is the high level of political turnover of managerial positions. So that every time uh, there is a new, um, say, a, a, a new regional minister in a certain in a certain uh, in a certain portfolio, so um, there's a high number of of top administrators that change. And since, despite the fact that for nine years, ten almost ten years now, essentially the same two parties have dominated uh, the Catalan regional government, they've switched. Uh, responsibility. So, for instance, uh, last year, I, I believe it was, um, all the, their, let's call them party A and party B, the two, the two pro-independence parties, uh, repeated coalition, but the, part of their agreement was that all the portfolios that were held by party A were now going to be held by party B. So essentially, it was a huge level of, of, of turnover in top managerial positions, and this has been blamed for slowing things down, preventing long-term thinking, and for essentially demoralizing uh, lower level administrators because then the plans constantly change. It's not clear who's responsible for what, et cetera. Now, um, the fourth and actually a very key uh, theme that respondents uh, mentioned was the fact that civil society and, and culture was crucial. Um, respondents in the Basque Country were said, uh, almost all of them, the Basque Country performs very well because we're small, because we're a close-knit society with low levels of inequality, and because we're small and close-knit, there is a strong accountability. People would say, I can bump into the movie, I can bump into the regional president when going to the movie theater, and that's normal here. And we know each other, we know how we're doing, we know if we still, if someone steals and becomes a lot richer, we would all know. And related to this, they mentioned the high levels of interpersonal trust and the, and the density of civic organization. So these were very classic arguments, right, for, for why um, the quality of government was very high in the Basque country. In Catalonia, many participants also said that uh, Catalonia was a fairly close-knit society, in, at least in some, in some areas, that there were uh, there were there was a higher than than average density of civic organizations, but this was spun or or in a different way by saying that the 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 uh, Catalan society and the strong um, civic networks essentially what it pushed for, for was for higher standards for what's quality of government for for what's um, 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 uh, impartiality, and so those higher standards explain to a large extent uh, the, the more negative perceptions. And they were also very quick, at least some of them, to point out that Catalans have a lower tolerance of corruption th than people in other regions in Spain. And in a way, for, uh, for some participants, what explains the fact that Catalonia fares very badly in terms of perceptions of corruption is not worse corruption or higher levels of corruption, but lower tolerance towards it. So let me now uh, conclude with uh, a quick summary, which is, first of all, interesting that two apparently similar regions have such disparate um, uh, scores in, in, quality, in perceived quality of government. Second, that participants tended to emphasize political context and culture, more, much more so than characteristics and structural characteristics of the public administration in the regions or in the central government. And um, in case this is useful for the, for the Q&A, um, something that uh, I think it, it interesting uh, as a broader consideration that, and that was actually brought up by several participants is 
the question of, okay, so these quality of government um, indicators are based on citizen perceptions. And so where do these perceptions come from? Is it, are they uh, explained by stable structural factors? Are they driven or shaped mostly by short-term contextual dynamics? And the fact that it's hard to disentangle between the two. Nicholas in, in, in his presentation was making a very strong case that stable structural factors must be explaining perceptions to a large extent because otherwise um, these perceptions would not have the correlate the, would not correlate as highly as they do with with other 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 measures. Um, and with this I conclude and I wanted to thank you for, for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo, uh, for your presentation. Uh, I encourage the, the audience to, and then our colleagues to ask the short questions uh, or technical questions in the chat and also to, to give us a, a sign if you would like to ask something. But we go straight to the uh, Polish case it will be presented by Barbara Wieliczko and me. And uh, Barbara, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so as has already been said, uh, we are presenting uh, the uh, findings of uh, our study conducted in two Polish regions, Lubelskie and Opolskie. So we conducted uh, our research uh, in Opolskie and uh, Lubelskie region uh, with 27 uh, respondents in Lubelskie and 24 in Opolskie. Uh, Poland uh, was getting better and better uh, in the index of uh, quality of uh, governance uh, conducted by, by our guests. Uh, but uh, the uh, last time, so uh, last year, it was uh, checked uh, in the fears for Polish regions and deteriorated. Uh, uh, the only uh, well uh, doing well uh, region was uh, Polska and Lubelskie. Uh, kept its low position. Uh, here you can see uh, all the Polish uh, um, regions uh, in the uh, uh, successive uh, um, uh, surveys of the uh, perception of quality of governance uh, in the Polish regions. And uh, um, the ones uh, marked uh, one in red and uh, is uh, Lubelskie, and uh, one in uh, blue is uh, Opolskie. Uh, so you can see that uh, um, uh, there was uh, a trend of uh, improving uh, the quality of governance in Poland, uh, but uh, uh, since uh, the previous uh, study in 2017, uh, the perception of the quality of governance in Poland uh, significantly deteriorated in almost all the regions, except only for Opolski. Um, the two regions are not that uh, varied in terms of uh, well-being, as shows uh, show the figures uh, of uh, OECD um, regional well-being. Uh, so uh, there are not significant uh, um, differences uh, between uh, the two regions when it comes to uh, the level of income uh, 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 and the other um, um, factors uh, shaping uh, well-being uh, in uh, these regions. And uh, our study materials were interviewed with, uh, as already said, 27 for Belsky and 24 for Opolsky uh, representatives of these regions. Uh, on the uh, on this slide, you can see that um, uh, th these groups uh, were very terms of uh, the sector they represented and uh, the age groups they represented. Uh, so the general uh, image uh, of the public institutions uh, it, uh, when it comes to the level of corruption, efficiency in delivering public services, and the level of impartiality uh, significantly differs uh, between these two regions. Uh, much uh, better opinions, much better uh, marks were given to um, institutions uh, in Opolski than uh, in Lubelski. So uh, we come to the averages uh, for uh, the answers uh, that gave an opinion and assessment uh, of the level of impartiality, efficiency of delivering services, uh, and level of corruption. And you can see uh, significant differences between the two regions, with Opolski uh, um, having uh, better institutions and uh, um, uh, better notes uh, in the opinions of the interviewed uh, participants of our study. 
And in Lubelski, uh, figures were significantly lower, uh, thus showing that uh, um, the quality uh, of uh, delivering public services and the level of corruption uh, were uh, seen uh, as uh, level of uh, efficiency lower and the level of corruption higher than in Lubelski. And here's some examples of uh, the opinions of uh, the people we uh, talked to. So, uh, uh, interviews in Lubelski said uh, the huge negative influence of politics on public institutions, the employment of people without the appropriate competences in specialist and managerial positions have very negative effects. Administration units are still very unfriendly to practitioners and patients. Especially in uh, the period of uh, the pandemic, the attitudes, uh, attitude of offices and officials towards uh, petitioners was visible. The low assessment of the quality of governance is due to both limited economic resources, the politics of the groupings leading the provisional assembly, and the weak position of NGOs. And uh, in Apostia, um, the examples of uh, opinions of our um, interviewees were. Generally speaking, I see a lot of attention put to adequately high quality of public service uh, delivery in government uh, offices uh, at different levels. Officials are being trained and they are improving their competences. It seems, however, that the prestige uh, of the profession of civil servant is fading. The salaries too. We are not uh, talking about the central level, but uh, the local and regional ones are hardly encouraging. Taking into account salaries in the public sector, relatively poor opportunities for promotion and the failing prestige of the profession, I believe that several uh, civil servants in the positive way should provide uh, work uh, taking into account the high quality of service. And um, another question asked uh, was uh, the level of confidence uh, in uh, such institutions as army, hospitals, uh, business owners, uh, political parties, wayboardship office, martial office, media, and police. And uh, the uh, trust uh, in almost uh, all institutions were significantly higher uh, in Opolsky uh, than in Lubelski, yeah, with uh, only uh, two exceptions, uh, where Lubelski, uh, uh, respondents in Lubelski um, had a uh, higher level of uh, confidence in the Wayworkship Office and uh, in Polis. And when it comes to organ uh, organizational culture uh, in public institutions uh, in both regions, uh, we can see uh, significant uh, differences. Uh, the most visible ones uh, are when it comes to assessing uh, the organizational you know, uh, culture in terms of how routine or how being dynamic and developing new policy agenda. Uh, uh, is uh, assessed, so uh, a much higher figure uh, in Opolsky than uh, in Lubelski. Uh, the other very significant difference uh, that can be seen is uh, the um, uh, organization, whether it's uh, uh, horizontal organization or vertical organization, so uh, better figures uh, for Opolsky than Lubelski. And uh, also significant difference uh, can be seen in the average uh, opinion uh, of the respondents when it comes to uh, cooperation. So uh, our interviewees uh, in Apolski uh, were more willing to uh, state that uh, uh, institutions in the region cooperate uh, with each other uh, than uh, in Lubelski. Uh, when it comes to implementing public institutions, um, um, the predominant strategy um, in Lubelski was seen as uh, punishing uh, people working there if they do not comply um, or do not offer uh, good uh, work. Uh, and uh, in Opolsky, uh, predominant strategy uh, is uh, rewarding uh, and giving opportunities and stimulants uh, to uh, have uh, the work done uh, correctly. Uh, some examples of opinions presented uh, by our interviewees. Uh, in Lubelski, personal political connections matter most. Competence is of little importance. I think that uh, to a large extent, connections and uh, then their competence. 
uh, in a post, yeah, uh, it seems that the higher the level of power, the more tempting it is. Uh, so these positions are rather uh, politically filled, especially if they involve a correspondingly high salary. It is no secret that in politically connected institutions, artificial managerial positions were and still are created, or existing ones are filled by politically connected people. Competence may uh, lie with lower level employees or freely elected bodies like local uh, authorities. Social capital is important here. And uh, the next uh, element of our study, uh, we asked our uh, interviewees uh, to imagine that something is uh, going wrong, done wrongly, uh, not uh, according to law in their institutions. So uh, whether such official would uh, report this or, or not. And uh, uh, in Opolskie, uh, more people uh, expressed the opinion that it would be reported by such a person. Uh, in Lubelski, but still the figures are, are very low and <clears throat> uh, most people uh, who, uh, more people think that uh, such thing would not be reported. Uh, when it comes to uh, whistleblowing, um, the figures are similar for, uh, for both uh, regions. Um, not much uh, difference between opinions uh, of our interviewees. Uh, so generally, um, um, they said that uh, people uh, would um, fear the repercussions uh, and would not uh, blow the whistle. Um, next institutions, uh, institution um, um, analyzed by us uh, were media. Uh, and generally, um, uh, the worst were uh, assessed in both region, um, national public TV. Um, and uh, generally, national media were worse uh, assessed than uh, regional media. Um, and generally, uh, pub, uh, private media were better assessed than uh, public media, uh, which is closely connected with the current situation. Um, we also asked uh, our interviewees uh, how free are media uh, in the region to report on such uh, issues uh, like corruption, security, economy, politics, and public health. Uh, so, um, also uh, this time, uh, uh, more free were assessed uh, media in Opolski than in Lubelski. And generally, uh, our interviewees uh, stated that uh, more freedom, uh, uh, media have more freedom when uh, reporting uh, some problems in economy uh, than uh, corruption of uh, officials. Uh, uh, violation of partiality, impartiality. Mm, generally, um, mm, People said that um, uh, people with uh, adequate political connections or personal contacts uh, can uh, easily access uh, public services that are limited. Uh, and uh, this opinion was uh, more present in Belsky than in Opolsky. Um, impact of you uh, improvement of uh, services. We asked uh, our interviewees whether um, they can see improvements in quality of services offered by uh, such institutions as schools, universities, hospitals, uh, courts of law, and police, uh, thanks to uh, Polish EU accession in 2004. Um, generally, uh, better uh, figures uh, were um, given by respondents in the polls here. Um, but uh, in Lubelski also the respondents uh, saw a significant improvements, uh, especially in education. Uh, some examples of opinions expressed by our interviewees in Opolski. Uh, the difficult financial situation in the public sector may reflect negatively on the work of public sector employees. Progressive part uh, partisanship of the state and appointments according to clientelistic criteria may uh, also lead to the deterioration of the public administration. Uh, 
Um, we also ask about the impact of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and uh, generally, uh, whether the uh, quality of services uh, was uh, influenced by the pandemic. Uh, so in the scale one to seven, when were seven is very positive, um, the figures were um, not that high. Uh, on average, uh, 2.8 in Basque and uh, 4.5 uh, in Apolski. Um, so uh, in Apolski region, um, respondents saw some improvements uh, in quality of uh, all the listed uh, institutions, uh, while in Lubelski, uh, this improvement was not that visible according to our uh, interviewees. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. And uh, now a few conclusions and uh, to sum up the, 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 the our study. Um, like first, we want to mention that economic set situation that was proved by uh, other uh, other analysis of other regions that economic situations like that has a very limited influence on the quality of a governance because both regions are not that well developed uh, in relation to the to the other uh, regions in Poland. Uh, but the evidence points in this respect to the traditions, value systems but also culture of the organization and, and of, uh, of social life. So uh, intangible uh, uh, assets uh, and indigenous uh, characteristics of a, of a given area. And uh, another observation is that the size of the structure matters. So they influence the perceived quality of governance. For Polska is more uh, uh, is polycentrics. Uh, this is because of the uh, of the many the small towns and the cities with the higher power in the local level. And Lubeska is quite of a, a region of a dominating center with, with uh, Lublin capital, uh, capital city, biggest influence on the economic and social life of the region. Uh, another issue is that uh, strong differences in, in the quality of our uh, government are related to the level of trust in the individual institution. It was well, well picturized in this presentation that, that the, uh, in the, the, each of the region, different institutions had a, a different levels of the trust. And this is, uh, this is the matter of a variation over the time. However, uh, however, uh, we, it, may, it may be noted that like in Lubelski, there is like a big, bigger confidence into like the more public uh, authorities and the Opolskie more concern to the, the, to the uh, local and, uh, government, but also NGOs and, and uh, the, the, the public services. And uh, in the Opolskie region, the level of trust institutions is clearly higher. Yeah, this is like the social perceptions is really connected by our respondents with the efficient use of the European funds, but also what was introduced, introduced uh, by the European, uh, let's say, uh, governance, so like approach to the uh, planning and the implementation and then evaluation and the public consultation in the public policy uh, design. Uh, so this was more visible in the Opolskie. Uh, because good, uh, our respondents mentioned the good cooperation between local government units and the good cooperation uh, between the, 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 the uh, government units and the NGOs and the citizens. So uh, the results show, and this is something that is like the, um, very visible in the analysis in Poland, regional approaches. That the historically shaped regional differences in Poland still have a significant influence on social economic development and the quality of governance. So that those historical pathways are uh, re relate, uh, interrelated with the values, culture of organization and the level of, of, of governance. And uh, some, uh, some advices also as a result of our discussion and interviews, uh, strengthening the power in local centers, further decentralization of funding, uh, especially uh, EU cohesion policy with the stronger power at the local level, uh, and the greater involvement of the citizens in decision-making. This is, like, this is uh, the, the two 
main characteristic that can be uh, can be pointed out when we are stuck, uh, looking for the ways to improve the quality of regional governance in Poland. But in Poland, uh, in both regions, and what is uh, worth stressing right now, European integration helps to strengthen institutions and positively influences the quality governance. And it is very clearly stressed uh, by our respondents in both regions. Even if those level is different at the regional level in cooperation, but in both regions, like the basis for the uh, for the uh, quality of the governance uh, and, and like perception of the institutions as lies in a, in a, a European uh, uh, re- European integration and our our membership in the European Union and this is what we would like to uh, stress as a uh, our message for the for the discussion and the, for, for, from the study. So thank you very much. Uh, now maybe for the discussion I'll have a few slides, but uh, now I would like to ask uh, Professor Wilkin. Uh, to address many issues we, we raised uh, to, uh, the today's seminar. Uh, Professor Wilkin uh, agreed to be our uh, discussant. So uh, right away, I'm uh, asking Professor to, for his opinion. And then we go for the discussion. Uh, for the, <coughs> our colleagues, please uh, put your questions and the comments on the chat. We'll come back to them. Thank you. Professor Wilkin, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to participate in this very, very interesting uh, conference. Uh, I will explain why uh, it is uh, useful and interesting, especially for me. Uh, And I I would like to thank uh, all people involved in the project and also presenting papers today, Uh, I think the project and uh, the papers, the outcome generally, uh, contributes significantly to the uh, understanding of the role of quality of governance uh, to functioning and development of contemporary society and economy. those who are dealing with uh, institutional um, studies know how important uh, from methodological point of view are comparative studies uh, in this field, including international. Um, through this, through using this method, you can uh, understand the role of institutions. Uh, because this is the area which is not so rich in some formal um, tools, uh, methodologies like contemporary uh, macroeconomics or uh, public finance or corporate finance and so on and so on. But the methodology uh, is, is developing quite well in, and it is common agreement that really institutions matter. Uh, uh, I'm additionally uh, grateful to to, um, people involved in this project uh, and and, uh, grateful for presentations because um, in this institute, we, orga- we will organize a public debate on the topic, how a quality of governance is changing in Poland. Uh, probably no, and from your studies, there are some um, proofs that the quality of governance is deteriorating in, in our country. The same as in Hungary and some others, but uh, we are afraid very much that this tendency will be continued. <clears throat> so we are uh, going to discuss first to to describe tendencies in the field of um, quality of governance, but also we will also discuss 
what we should do to stop these negative trends and improve situation. Uh, also, <laughs> it was very interesting for me to, to learn that uh, in the Swedish uh, University, University of Gothenburg, there is special, I think, relatively large institute, the, the Quality of Governance Institute, and um, that um, established in 2004, as I remember, uh, which uh, got for research grants for 15 million euro. Uh, it's very good that such money were delivered, uh, dedicated to this field of, of, of research, because uh, <clears throat> this is very important field. field. When you uh, read um, publications by um, World Bank or OECD, the topic generally quality of governance, good governance, and so on, um, is more and more important. It is re regarded as one of the uh, foundations of contemporary development and uh, also for improving quality of life of people and strengthen democracy also. So it is very, very important uh, topic. Um, I was happy that I, I could um, uh, organized research uh, a few years ago, it was 2011 and 12, on the quality of government in Poland. Uh, as an outcome of this project was relatively large book in the title is Quality of Government in Poland, how we should uh, research uh, monitor and improve. Uh, and we've got for the three year project around 100,000 uh, euro for the whole group, for the whole project, for publications, and so on, so on. So you can, you can compare uh, what is the involvement of public institutions in supporting that kind of uh, uh, research. My observation is that um, most of the government We cannot hear you right now. Something happened, to the Professor. We cannot hear. Uh, the government don't like when uh, scholars, people, generally NGOs and so on, look at their hands. Um, as main recommendations from our study was that we should organize a research group uh, who can do uh, permanently research uh, on this subject and monitor uh, quality of governments in, in Poland as it would be possible also in comparison with other countries. But there was not any research institution, a grand uh, instit uh, delivering institution or, or, or political supporting this, this project. So th this is, I think, an uh, interesting case. Uh, another one, very important um, subject, is terminology. We are discussing today on uh, quality of government, uh, and we have different um, categories, very important. Uh, of course, traditionally it was governing, which was mostly from the top, regulating different fields, organizing, and so on. And we are moving to the governance, which is relatively, it is different subject and different uh, way of organizing society and economy. 
uh, governance uh, needs interrelation and cooperation of uh, individuals, of uh, NGOs, local and regional governments, and so on, so on. Uh, I don't think that we now um, can um, arrange good society, good democratic society, and also uh, put it on the um, on the route of sustainable development without uh, introducing and implementing governance rules, governance factors, and 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 uh, this whole way of organizing society. Uh, when we uh, were doing our project, we, of course, concentrated on Polish uh, field, and we um, uh, concentrate our research on six fields of good governance. First, it was democracy and rule of law. Uh, second was um, transparency. Uh, next was uh, accountability, uh, participation, uh, social and economic inclusion, and also uh, efficiency. Efficiency uh, of uh, indifferent, not only financial efficiency. So that, that, that was a very important um, uh, <laughs> categories for our research. And also, uh, going to uh, some comparative studies, um, I, I'm not surprised that, for example, when you compare Opolskie region and um, Lubelskie, there are significant differences. Uh, I think, first, it, uh, it confirms that really history matters. History matters. The, the, both regions have uh, very different historical background, and it was uh, presented in um, Wieliczko and, and uh, Wieliński paper, um, but also um, another is the impact of contemporary political situation in our country, which contributes to this um, difference between both regions. What was interesting, uh, and probably not many people uh, know this fact, that uh, during so-called uh, EU accession referendum, which took place in 2003, there was only one region when rural people, people living in rural areas, voted against uh, joining European Union. Uh, but later, this region got the, the biggest money from the EU fund for rural development. So it is irony of history, uh, in my opinion. And also, when uh, there were many aspects, uh, one of them was why in Warsaw there is dark color presenting the level of corruption uh, in, in one of, of your slides. Uh, First, of course, we know that corruption has different faces. We have traditional corruption uh, and we have political corruption. I don't think that political corruption was included in, in the, the, the research. It is very difficult, by, by the way. Uh, but in Warsaw are concentrated big money. Uh, and, uh, of course, there are uh, a lot of uh, opportunities, but I think a lot of temptations to 
organize uh, corruption uh, in, in different forms. But uh, as I remember, when we studied uh, the level of corruption in Poland, it was declining uh, for years, but situation again is in uh, increasing. And, uh, corruption, uh, level of corruption is increasing. And generally, the quality of governance is deteriorating. And it is um, visible in your study, in international um, uh, rankings, uh, which we have now, several of them, and so on, so on. So it means that um, it is the field of uh, first research, but also a field of special sorrow. And uh, uh, it, uh, I encourage you and uh, support that kind of research because in my opinion, they are very, very important from academic point of view and practical point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for this introduction. Yes, we are like uh, a host institution for the seminar is Institute of uh, Rural and Agricultural Development of the Polish Academy of Sciences. So therefore we have the picture and like the, let's say we focus on the perspective of Poland. How that, however, uh, all the, all the uh, presentations were a good introduction for the general discussion. Uh, and the Poland and the Spain are both very good uh, examples. Poland even uh, even more because of the big influence of the of the EU accession and what was happening after we joined the EU is uh, a big uh, influence of those rules and the policy making schemes for on the on the activities and the performance of the public services but also public ad administration so thank you very much this this was uh, uh, introduction to the general discussion and i encourage everyone to to, um, to put your hands on the virtual hand up or put the questions on the chat, but uh, I will start the general uh, discussion with the two questions uh, of the Professor Krzysztof Gorlach. Um, I guess those questions are uh, addressed uh, to our uh, guest from University, University of Gothenburg. Uh, the Professor Krzysztof Gorlach raised two, two issues. One is, what is the impact of the quality of national governments to the quality of sub-national ones? And the clear comments from our presenters. And another question is, uh, does decentralization of a nation state help to improve quality of local government? So one is about the uh, interrelation between the, the regional and national quality of governance. And the second is about the the how is decentralization influencing the quality of governance? So this will be the question, I guess, to all of us. I would like to ask uh, uh, Monika or, or Nicolas if you would like to address the, the, those questions. And then I would like to ask if, if Pablo would like to, to also to mention something and, and Professor Vipin as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, professor's comments on the study uh, and it was, it was very interesting to hear about your work previously in Poland as well uh, and how you're thinking about quality of government uh, somewhat similarly but also differently than, than us um, so very interesting thank you uh, and as far as the question um, about the national government in relation to the regional level government yeah of course they're they're very they're very related in in the sense that the regions are are you know embedded in a country uh, culture and an environment, and so therefore, I mean, if you look at our at our map, uh, it's 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 certainly not random where the regions are. Like um, uh, in terms of their ranking, I mean, there there's a lot of clustering, and that's because a we're not uh, we're not capturing all of the quality of government that a region has because they uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of national level institutions that spill over into the into the regions as well that affect the climate. 
Um, and so there, there's, a, there's obviously a relation. Uh, I would say in terms of the, uh, the, de the degree to which the regions are different within a country is very much impacted by the, um, the national level of quality of government. Uh, and so when the national level of quality of government is, is very high, at least in our case, uh, we see that the, the regions tend to be very, they, they tend to be rated very much similarly. And so in Sweden and in, in, in Denmark, I mean, Denmark is a nice case, for example, because Denmark actually has uh, quite a bit of regional control when it comes to uh, healthcare, for example. Um, the regions are popularly elected. Uh, the popular elected uh, officials design healthcare programs that meet the, the, the needs of their own region. Um, and therefore, you might expect there to be some sort of uh, differences in terms of how citizens rate their healthcare, but there, there are no discernible differences in this, in this area. For example, the Netherlands is also a very good example of this, very high level of quality of government and, and regions that have some administrative control over our, our, our services, but we see very little. And then you go to lower quality of government, uh, at least within Europe. Even places like Romania, uh, you look at Italy, for example, which has lower quality of government, um, you know, Bulgaria in a number of, of years. And the regions, even if they don't have a lot of, um, you know, regional authority in, in what, the, what they have over the healthcare or the education, they tend to rate things very differently. So it, it does imply that lower quality of government at the national level, there might be favoritism of certain regions. Uh, there might be uh, some regions might feel like they're not getting the investments that other regions are getting and things like this. So this has a lot to do with, with probably the national climate. But this is, a, this is a very interesting and very consistent thing that we find is that the regional disparity is very much related with the national level of the government. Decentralization, another question that was asked, uh, we, we, we see a very ambiguous relationship with this. Um, you know, federal countries like Austria and Germany, they don't display a lot of, uh, of um, of, 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 of subnational variation, whereas countries that are close to federal, like Spain and, and Italy, there's a lot of, uh, of variation. Um, some countries that are very centralized uh, have a lot of disparities where others don't. So it, it's very difficult to say. Uh, and we don't have a lot of cases uh, during, during the time we've been measuring where, which have undergone a lot of decentralization or centralization. Uh, so we can't really map this over time uh, with a lot of empirical certainty. But, uh, but the, at least the, the spatial variation that we observe, is, uh, it points to a very ambiguous relationship. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know if Monica would like to add something. No, just on decentralization, that this very much maps into the research field on decentralization, where findings are, are typically very mixed. Right, so the, the difficulty with with this decentralization in, in in general is, of, of course, if you if you feel that power moves move closer to the citizens, you would increase accountability, and 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 also perhaps knowledge and responsiveness. Uh, but on the other hand, we know that that in 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 situations where local governments may lack in capacity, they may also be the subject to patronage ties and networks, and 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 then start start to be become more dysfunctional with more power. So. I think this very much maps into the broader research field where we actually do not really know. And, and there are lots of ifs and buts in terms of, of the extent to which decentralization works uh, to improve the quality of government and, and, and reduce uh, corruption levels. But thanks again. And thanks also to the discussant for, for excellent questions and comments and insights uh, uh, on this. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll address those questions also to Pablo. Uh, because I guess like the insights from the regional uh, cases is really interesting in both uh, for the both question because we observe also in Poland that like the respondents are tending to divide the perception of the national quality of governance and the regional because this is also attached the the specific culture and also by the attachment abandoned of the of the interviewee in the local ecosystem. And this is the, also about the centralization. It is also visible when we were both uh, discussing in the Spain and Poland uh, the, the, the size of the regions, the smallest regions. Uh, 
there seems to be a better performance, uh, they have a better performance uh, in, in terms of a quality of a governance. And, and maybe this is something what was mentioned by Nicholas, like the, 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 and then by, by Pablo, uh, that this is uh, the, the matter of cooperation and good communication. But Pablo, what do you think about it? Uh, well, thank you very much, Paul, and thank you for, for the question, for the discussion. Um, so, I mean, what, what I can say is essentially uh, briefing off of uh, what you were mentioning and what Nicholas and, and Monica were saying, that um, the Spanish case is interesting because the rules are very similar across all regions, and yet we find the formal rules, and this is something that Nicholas was brought up earlier, the formal rules are very similar across regions, and yet the performance or the perceived performance is very, it's widely different according to, to citizens. Um, so, and it's also interesting that participants seem to um, raise more questions, so raise explanations that had to do more with the size of the region and the culture of the region or the type of society within the region more, than, more so than on, on, on rules. Um, my intuition would be that perhaps decentralization um, allows for or enables disparity across regions, given some circumstances. But clearly, I mean, Monica and Nicholas were saying that there's no clear correlation between decentralization and, and disparity in performance. So it, it might have to do with some decentralization only creates divergence given some, some third factors. That's my, that's my intuition. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if Professor Deakin would like to address or, or maybe later uh, as, a, as, a, as a contribution to the, uh, to the general debate um, from the point of observer about <laughs> centralization. <laughs> Uh, because Poland, Poland, uh, Polish case is very interesting here. I guess all the studies show that the centralization helps in many issues, like the, the design of a policy, the quality of uh, public services, and so on, and the participation of a, of a citizens in the in the design of a policy, which is very important, and also uh, probably for the quality of the governance. Um, Okay, uh, first I will start with the uh, question, why institute like our institute dealing with rural development and agriculture, the name of the institute uh, is, is this, um, uh, is dealing with um, quality of governance, uh, some uh, general uh, economic uh, questions or so on so on. First, I think that if you uh, want to understand uh, contemporary rural uh, or village and agriculture, you should know what's going on in much, much broader um, surrounding uh, social, political, uh, economic, and so on, so on. So we are, it is the reason that we are trying to conduct research also in some fields, uh, like, for example, quality of governance, which is very important. We can show how important is improving of European, I mean EU, country and regional uh, governance for better utilization of resources, uh, including financial resources and the material resources located in uh, regions, countries, and so on. So uh, th this is the uh, very important issue for general development. And I think that uh, without uh, implementing um, good governance, uh, let's say, uh, dimensions or variables, you cannot keep uh, and develop democratic society, and you cannot uh, keep also uh, the mm, root on sustainable de development. Uh, and th this is uh, why I said that 
your your project and that kind of field of study is so so important and really we are going to continue some of that issues uh, of course we have as most of our uh, academic institutions financial problems uh, with financing uh, different projects for example, the budget of our institute is the same as four years ago. And uh, for example, inflation this year is around uh, 10%. So mean, it means that we will have much less money for uh, everything, you know, which is uh, related to our activity. But anyway, we are determined uh, to uh, to select uh, the most important and fascinating from the research point of view uh, areas and topics. And this is one of them. Uh, and I'm glad uh, and I would like to thank uh, all of you uh, for um, organizing this uh, project and organizing this conference, especially to Paweł Chmieliński, local organizer of, but also very important um, participant in this project. So thank you very much. And I'm glad that uh, over 40 people were interested in our seminar. Okay, thank you very much. And we have uh, the, the, the uh, one hand raised by I don't know, someone that is called Bartosz. So please uh, ask your question or comment and, and introduce yourself. Thank you. Yes, so it's me. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, Bartek Czepil and I'm from University of Opole. So actually I represent the region which performs quite well in, uh, in this amazing study. So thank you for, for being uh, uh, in this seminar. And actually this was amazing for me and fascinating just to, to observe these case studies. And I actually have some question to to professor uh, 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 professor Chmieliński, actually to the authors of the study of uh, Opolskie and uh, and Lubelskie yes uh, because i see that in this study you didn't put any attention to existence of german and silesian minority in opolskie region this is kind of a peculiarity uh, of the uh, of this region comparing to Belsky, for example and i'm wondering why is it so is it because for example your respondents you got 24 of them so maybe they just did, they didn't put any attention to this factor yes from my personal perspective as a political scientist sociologist dealing with this region a little bit i think that it might be important yes because uh, for example we have this uh, patterns of uh, cooperation kind of inter-ethnic cooperation in the region both at the local level at the regional level, I mean cooperation between a German minority and, and po Polish majority, basically, yes. So this is something what contributes to this culture of cooperation. And I know that the parts of the Opolskie region where you do have a German minority, as yes, uh, about at a, 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 a kind of a local level in terms of social life, but also in institutions, I mean communal councils, there is a higher level of political participation, yes. So uh, I think that this might be some contributing factor to this better performance. And uh, I think that this might be also important because I see that in the case of, uh, of Basque region, you also have a patterns of interaction ethnic cooperation, which have been presented as something that contributes to, to better quality uh, of, govern uh, of government, basically. Yes. So my question is, why is it so? Why this kind of a German factor, let's say, was, was, was kind of a, uh, omitted? Is it because your respondents basically don't find it important? Thank you very much for this excellent question, because it raises things that we haven't shown in our presentation, but I, I know that this is important. We, we like the uh, analyze in our report and also in interviews where uh, we're stressing the influence of the first cooperation, then uh, the, 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 uh, the commute, like the, the work relations between the two countries and like the influences of the let's, uh, historical, uh, traditional uh, development pathways uh, in Poland. And we have everything uh, of this included in the report, but this goes to the conclusion that like the system of the culture and like the values 
which is one of the, the parts of the quality governance uh, are very important uh, uh, in the, in the, uh, for the level of the governance, but this is everything behind of, of this. And why investigating, we have uh, Dr. Wojciech Okioa here, and he's like the, 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 the also who was commenting and, 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 and helping us uh, also Professor Hefner. So we, we, had a, we were in contact also with the researchers and also we are referring to a rich literature. Uh, but I could show, um, show the graph showing like the, the historical uh, paths of the development of Poland and, 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 and then border of the division of the development, but also the, 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 the quality of governance. Uh, however, this is like the topic, this is uh, quite, quite present in our debate. So to, to, uh, to put this uh, short, uh, this is in the report, and this is in like the something that we uh, put a lot of attention on, but also we were wanted to, to, to seek for another characteristics that also influence to the composition of a quality of governance uh, index. And this leads me also to the, to the recommendation because like our uh, report is still waiting for the approval by the DG Regio, I guess, Monika, yes. And, and th therefore, like, once it will be ready, it will be available uh, on the website of the University of, of Goth Gothenburg, I guess. Uh, but also we try to put it if, if there will be the, the possibility on the seminar webpage. So I encourage everyone to take a look in the, in the, in the report. Uh, we stress this issue uh, because this is, this is one of the important, I guess, key elements, uh, key findings of the study. But um, broadly speaking, organizational culture and the system of a value and the traditions, also the relations uh, with the, the, the other countries matter for the quality of the governance. So with those partners. Thank you very much for this question. Thank you for your answer, but if I may just, uh, I'm, uh, just one comment when it comes to uh, polycentric uh, structure of a Polsky region, of, uh, because just, uh, I believe that this is a result of uh, kind of opinions of 24 respondents, yes? But just uh, from my point of view, for example, this might be put under question a little bit that the uh, Polsky region has a polycentric structure. Of course, self-government is quite important. Yes, you do have a, you do have a kind of a importance of this uh, uh, localities and, and this idea of self-government is important, but but uh, if you look at the urban structure of the region, yes, this you know of course we know that this is the smallest one, and you have a one big let's say for regional standard city, which is city of Opole with one hundred thirty thousand cities, and then all other cities, the second cities, well, they are quite small because the the, the, the biggest second city has a sixty thousand, then you have a fifty thousand, forty thousand. So from my point of view, just basically, uh, uh, I would rather say that the uh, city of Opole has a monopolistic position in the urban structure of the region. Yes, uh, uh, I, I would consider that basically, yes, that there is a one region, one kind of agglomeration, not, not region, excuse me, one big city, and then all other, all, all other uh, um, elements of, uh, of our urban structure are rather kind of a smaller ones, and there is a kind of a general tendency to see Opole as a center of the region. Uh, basically, and this takes me also to the question, which is maybe not uh, uh, something which should be put to, uh, to you, because it's about methodology and uh, having responded from the region. I'm not sure about the sample, uh, but the kind of did you control for geographic distribution of respondents in the region? Because I have this feeling, just I was trying to explain good performance of Opole region uh, among other regions of Poland. Did you, uh, or is there a chance that, for example, respondents from the city of Opole? They will be overrepresented in the sample, or respondents from specific districts of the region, like uh, districts where you had influence of German minority, basically. Yes, uh, because there are eleven districts. Some of them they are a little bit different than other Western districts of the polar region. So this is my question: Is it possible, basically, that the distortion of the sample in favor of specific uh, 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 specific districts of the region might 
contribute to overrepresentation of uh, specific attitudes and basically and better assessment of, of institutions basically uh, in these communes which perform quite well because of a German influence, for example. So this would be my question, and this is the last one. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll start and give the floor to Nicolas because this is like the, the question of our methodology. We had the same methodology for the uh, both countries and four regions, and this is like the the, the uh, methodology comes from the approach for the uh, quality of uh, governance index uh, as designed for the all the regions in Europe. So the, 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 I will I will give the, the, this opportunity to Nicolas to to uh, respond to this question. I'll just mention that like, of course, the, the, uh, the approach uh, was to, to select the people uh, based on a few, uh, few categories of the, of the respondents we were seeking for. And of course, in those countries, in those, in those, in those regions and like, the, like in every region, the representation of the respondents influences because this is like most most of the questions are about the uh, perception, and here we were uh, doing the in-depth studies with the people that are active in the social life. So we wanted to ask the people that are involved in different spheres of a social economic life in the region. Of course, over representation. Um, there is an over representation because we, we sometimes we don't seek for the representatives of a small village, but this is the, the, the approach of the study. In depth uh, studies, also, uh, I know the studies, uh, many studies of the uh, University of Opole and, and, and uh, scientific uh, institutions from the Opolske. Uh, that are dealing very deeply with this uh, topic. And that's why I thank you for this question. I will give the floor to the Nicolas and it was just, uh, and also while we were preparing the, 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 the report, uh, we found and we were, were referring to many studies, uh, not many, but like the, 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 the general studies that are showing the issue more deep uh, from the perspective of the region. So, so this is from, from, uh, from our perspective as, uh, as uh, uh, authors of the, the, the Polish uh, study. Nicolas, would you like to, to, to uh, you know, I can just I can just say thank you for the question. It's a very good question. Um, it, of, of, of course, I mean, we, we try to make uh, the most representative sample that we can given the resources that we have and the knowledge a priori of what the region looks like that we, that we can. So, I mean, I would say in terms of like the sampling, it is a random sample at the telephone interview level. So, I mean, you presume that like, you know, in a, in a perfect world, you get a relatively representative geographic uh, uh, sam uh, distribution of, that match the population as well. The online sample is, is more of a self-selection. So that probably does favor more larger cities or at least more urban areas on average than, than not. The way that we sort of compensate for this is that we, we aggregate all of our individual level data using post stratification weights. So we, we wait for the age, we wait for the gender, and we wait for the education of the respondent. And we anchor that uh, in Eurostat estimates. So, I mean, if the thinking is like maybe, um, you know, higher educated, um, you know, more urban citizens will be favoring the region in some way. I mean, we do weight down those respondents when we aggregate the, we don't do it by geography, but we do it by education. So I think it's kind of a proxy of what you're saying, but we don't have such fine grained, uh, you know, original population estimates of like the, the, the municipalities or something like this. Yeah. No, we can't, we, because of anonymity, we don't have a lot of that information, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very good point. So you're, you're right. Perhaps, but uh, we do our best to compensate. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just yeah. Okay. thank you very much. Uh, we are about the time. Uh, I don't, I don't see any questions or comments. Uh, so I would like to uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, thank to our presenters. I guess we had uh, three hours of a nice, uh, um, nice portion of uh, information and the discussion. Also uh, tackling with the, I guess, very, very important issue right now that was stressed at the beginning. I would like to stress right now that the quality of governance uh, 
leads to the quality of institutions and the, 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 the relations between the people and and uh, with the good institutions and the good quality of governance, just like the Harvard, for example, to start the war or or, uh, or uh, steal people and and uh, and uh, run with the populism. So uh, so if what we are uh, for now, we would like to invite you for the uh, for the debate on the quality of governance that will be on the 28th of the March. Uh, this debate is will be uh, in Polish. However, it will tackle the very important issue, uh, a very important issue, and our our speakers will be uh, Professor Wilkin, Professor uh, Jerzy Hausner. Professor Andrzej Rehat uh, from the Polish Academy of Sciences, Professor Jerzy Hausner from the uh, from the Open Eyes Economy Summit, uh, representing the the uh, Foundation for the Administration and the Economy, uh, Public Economy, but also will, uh, there will be the representatives of the uh, uh, territorial units, uh, Ms. Dorota Zmazlak. Uh, she's leading the, the, the municipal activity, Isabelle. So this will be very good, uh, very good composition of the uh, of the uh, speakers and for this debate. And also, uh, I would like to thank you and encourage you to take a look uh, and come back to our uh, seminar webpage where we will publish this uh, this seminar as I said, recorded. But also, we hope to publish more materials about the study we, we were presenting today. So, once again, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to host our uh, honorable guest from, uh, from Quality of Governance, CCT Rotova, University of Gothenburg, also from the uh, University Carlos III of Madrid. Uh, and uh, this is it. Thank you very much. Uh, the seminars we can close. Thank you.